What's up guys? It's yo boy Omni Sensei. Welcome to What If I Was Reborn in Naruto as Uchiha and Uzumaki Hybrid. Part 4. Like, share, and comment on the video. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't subscribed. Also, remember to check out the original story. Link in the description. With all that out of the way, enjoy. We will begin with rank 32 and proceed in descending order. Taki's voice trailed as Oishi inquired, I see that you guys have changed things from last time. What brought about the change? This was a change introduced by one of our Jounin. He argued that in as much as we want more Jenins becoming Chunins in the village, we should also focus on the quality of the Shinobi that we produce, to achieve the Chunin rank, these young Shinobi will be tested on their decision making. The test would show whether the genins are able to make calculated risks. This is important as the rank they want to achieve is basically a squad leader who should know when to strike and when to bid their time. The other thing tested would be how they react in tense situations, especially during constant combat, as they can find themselves in a similar situation in an enemy camp where they have to fight to the death. You really are thorough. I hope that this increases our chances at the next war. Oishi praised Hiruzen. Danzo, who was sitting next to the two, just nodded in agreement to what Hiruzen said, something that caught the daimyo's eye. He might be an old man, but he wasn't stupid. He was aware of the friction between the two ever since Tobarama died, that was why seeing them agree on something was a breath of fresh air. Fortunately, the friction between the two was not to the extent of causing significant damage to the running of the village, at least not yet. Back in the stage below, the last 10 ranks were in shambles as they all scrambled to challenge each other so that they could escape the bottom ranks. Aiko was lucky enough to escape all the chaos there without having gotten any challenges thrown her way. When her turn reached, she obviously challenged rank 19 as that was the upper limit she had as rank 24. An orphan challenged me? You should just know your place. As soon as rank 24, Achiha Yori stepped on the ground, she started ranting about how Aiko wasn't worthy of fighting her. Great, another stuck-up clan kid. Renjiro remarked as he focused on the match about to unfold. If Renjiro was honest, he was cringing at the interaction. Never mind, even side characters need their moments. Meanwhile, Aiko took all the taunts with great stride. She was completely focused on her goals, which were ranking up in the Chunin exam finals and actually ranking in life by becoming a Chunin. Begin. As the instruction from their proctor fell on their ears, Yori was the first to make the move. She dashed forward while performing some hand signs simultaneously. As she neared her perceived target, she shouted, fire style, great fireball jutsu. Why isn't she activating her Sharingan? Speaking is one thing, but is she really demeaning me? Aiko thought. Aiko, with her keen observation skills, anticipated Yori's attack and swiftly dodged to the side, avoiding his flaming ball. She had had a few spars with her teammates, so such a jutsu wouldn't be much of a hassle. With a graceful movement, Aiko countered with her own series of precise strikes. She used the tornado fist jutsu as well as the wind cloak jutsu which gave her great offensive capabilities by wrapping winds on her hands. The cloak boosted her speed and defense as she decided to engage Yori in close combat. Riku-sensei wanted me to be bolder with my taijutsu. Besides, this is the only effective option that I have since she has a Shar, wait, why hasn't she used her Sharingan? Or does she not have a Sharingan? The fight evened out after Aiko decided to use her taijutsu because Yori was not a pushover in that field. It is confirmed, she has not awakened her Sharingan. This makes it way easier. Aiko decided to use her Jinjutsu. Once she did it was over for Yori as she tied things up. She was left in a trance in the arena and the proctor's voice declaring Aiko as the winner brought her out of the Jinjutsu. The only reason Aiko did not bother using her Jinjutsu or Ninjutsu was because she had seen firsthand how versatile the Sharingan was. Too bad Yori was just a dumbed-down version of Renjiro without all the talk. Congratulations Aiko! Hiro congratulated Aiko as she arrived right beside him. She was now one rank above him. 
Although Hiro knew that it was temporary, it still lit a fire under him to perform well. Hiro on the other hand, had a harder path as compared to Aiko. In between Aiko ranking up and him getting a chance to do the same, he received not one but two challenges. I can't really blame them. Hiro was just from a fight, so he would be an easier target. I would do the same if I was in their position. Renjiro thought as he witnessed it. He calmly faced and disposed of his opponents in the back-to-back -back challenges he received. Thankfully, both fights did not require much effort from him as he finally got his chance to rank up. Who do I challenge? Should I challenge Renjiro? I could finally shut his mouth if I won. No, I have already been challenged while he hasn't. I guess I will have to challenge rank 16 then. I challenge rank 16. Hiro declared as he made his way to the arena. Rank 16 promptly followed Hiro to the arena to begin their fight. Rank 16 was a civilian genin called Kazuki Arai. He was from a merchant family in the village. The decision not to challenge Renjiro weighed heavily on Hiro. While he acknowledged that Renjiro was strong, he still wanted to know who would come on top between the two. It's probably for the best, besides, I can always challenge him later. Hiro consoled himself. Begin. As the battle began, Hiro decided to take a different approach than he usually would. He started off with a ninjutsu. Who are these people? It's like Aiko and Hiro switched places for the day. Renjiro commented. Hiro charged forward with lightning speed, his movements were fluid and graceful. With a flicker of his hand, he unleashed a barrage of kunai towards Arai. That was no issue for Arai, but what followed was. Hiro slammed his hands on the ground as he shouted, Earth Spike Jutsu. Hiro's strategy was simple, confine his opponent to a certain space and finally finish things off. And that was exactly what happened. He had already set a precedent of how he fought with the first two fights just to switch it up during this third fight. Hiro's fight was welcomed with cheers more than any of the previous ones, granted that they had not seen many of the big hitters fight yet. Unfortunately, as Renjiro was still in a good mood from his teammate's win, Rank 17 finally issued his challenge. It was Rank 15. What did he challenge me for? Renjiro nearly uttered out loud. Was Renjiro sure he could win this fight? Yes. Did he want to be challenged? No. Renjiro felt getting challenged was a waste of energy, if he could, he would have already challenged the top rank and gotten done with this. But even that would have brought problems because he was sure some stupid genins would have wantonly challenged him just because he occupied the top rank. There's no way around this. He sighed as he resigned himself to his fate. Without any hesitation, Renjiro followed rank 17 to the arena. Rank 17 was a genin called Suji Inazuka. He had been a genin for three years and this was the second time he was taking the Chunin exams. This time around, he had improved and even managed to qualify for the last stage of the exams. A stark contrast to his first attempt where he never made it out of the forest of death with both the heaven and earth scrolls. Since Suji wanted to make a huge statement, he wanted to challenge a strong competitor. He was doing this to increase his chances of becoming a Chunin. I only know of one strong person here since he is my teammate, but I can't challenge him since he is way up in the ranks. I could challenge rank 12, but Makoto spoke highly of rank 15, Uzumaki Renjiro. She said that he was the strongest while they were in the academy, and he even graduated earlier than her, so he should be strong. As the two genin stood face to face at the arena, the tension was palpable. The Inazuka got a weird feeling and decided to feed his Ninken a solder pill. He did not know why he suddenly got the feeling, but being cautious wouldn't cost anything. Meanwhile, Renjiro was just angry. He had the option of challenging the 12th rank, so why did he choose me instead? I seriously do not have time for unnecessary plays. I guess I need to put on a show for anyone who wants to challenge me next. As he resolved to make an example out of Suji, Renjiro took a long breath and waited for the proctor to give the go-ahead to start the match. The proctor, a seasoned Chunin, raised his hand high, his voice echoing across the arena. Begin. With the signal given, Suji and Shimabakuro, his Nin Ken, sprang into action determined to claim victory. Their instincts guided their movements as they dashed forward towards their target with the astounding speed. Both boy and animal unleashed a flurry of punches and kicks in Renjiro's direction, unfortunately for him, Renjiro was no stranger to close combat. With lightning-fast agility, 
He dodged Suji's attacks, his movements fluid and precise. In a swift motion, Renjiro retaliated with a series of swift strikes, after reinforcing his body with his chakra. Arg! Suji grunted in frustration as he felt the force of Renjiro's blows, his defenses crumbling under his relentless assault. Woof! Shimabakuro barked in encouragement, urging his partner to press on despite the resistance they were facing. In a desperate attempt to turn the tide of the battle, Suji and Shimabakuro unleashed one of their numerous technique, Double Wolf Fang. Roar! With a fierce roar, they charged towards Renjiro, their combined attack creating a whirlwind of destruction in their wake. Renjiro dodged the combined attack, but he did not do so unscathed. He had some scratches and cuts. He was also bleeding, but it was still manageable. That's it, you want to play with sharp things, then two can play that game. Renjiro retrieved his bois, staff, from one of his storage seals. He didn't have poison, at least not yet, but the basic form of the weapon would satisfy his intent. The act of Renjiro retrieving his weapon surprised a lot of people. Only a select few were aware of his staff, that was his sensei, Team 15, Kushina, Miwa and of course, Hiruzen. His occasional peeking on his shinobi's activities gave him a front seat to one of Renjiro's practice sessions. I need to finish quickly, without showing much of my hand. You never know when one of my competitors will surprise me and push me to the wall. Renjiro separated his staff into batons. He locked his eyes on his opponents and with a burst of energy, he closed in on them. Suji's instincts flared as Renjiro headed towards him, and he decided to use his final card against Renjiro. It was a move that he had prepared for his teammate, whom he was going to challenge, but the recent circumstances forced him to use it against Renjiro. Fire Beast Fong. Suji shouted. Suji and Shimabakuro repeated an attack similar to their previous one. It was like a whirlwind of claws was heading towards Renjiro, but the difference was that there was fire accompanied by it. The Inazuka clan uses elemental jutsu? Renjiro muttered in shock but still continued with his attack. As the two were close to colliding, a voice suddenly interrupted them, Winner, Uzumaki Renjiro, huh? What just happened? Suji was confused with his gaze falling to his body. As he examined his body, Suji noticed slashes all over him and Shimabakuro. They were not really deep, but they were bleeding nonetheless. You just stood there as she slashed at you and your dog, the Chunin Proctor shed more light. Was all that in my head? Shit. I should have never looked into his eyes, Tsum told me not to. He walked off the arena and headed to the medical Nina around since he needed medical attention. Still, even if part of the fight happened in my head, it was fun. At least now I know that the fight for the top rank would be fun to watch. Suji continued to delude himself despite being relegated to rank 18. Meanwhile, Renjiro received a lot of questions from his teammates as he returned to the rank 15 platform. Was that really necessary, Renjiro? Hiro asked. Yes, making Suji a dummy practice for me was necessary for me to stop challenges coming my way. They are annoying and unnecessary, I thought you would understand after your experience. Renjiro made sense which forced Hiro into a dilemma. Hiro knew it wasn't good, but it was necessary. After a long back and forth in his mind, Hiro relented as they shifted their focus to the fights. The challenges continued and Renjiro got his chance to challenge someone and he won, moving him to rank 10. After everyone got their chance to challenge other people, the Genins were given a half hour break. Weird enough, the first rank has not been challenged. Is he strong, or are they just cowards? Either way, right now between Hiro and Aiko, I am the only one with the opportunity to get the top rank. So it is inevitable I will fight him. The second round continued with everyone getting their second challenge option. All members won their next challenges and ranked up. After his display against Suji, Renjiro never got any challenge thrown his way and was the one dishing them out. He had fought one of his friends, Inabi, to get to the fifth rank. It was a pure show of skill that lasted far longer than Renjiro expected, but he still came out on top through his stamina. It was the first time he fought an Uchiha who was closer to his own power level. Inabi copied all his moves whether it was ninjutsu or taijutsu. Renjiro could also not use jinjutsu for obvious levels. It also made Renjiro reflect on his actions ever since he transmigrated. From the very start, he always had a lot of paths that he could follow with the mixed heritage he had. 
Because of his greed, and overall excitement of transmigrating, he become impulsive and tried to be a jack of all trades. That was why some people, cough some readers cough, may think that he was not tapping into his full potential. Renjiro was aware of this and knew if he wanted to stand against foes coming in the future, he had to become a master of all trades. Fortunately, he had time to do so. He just had to pace himself as he knew this was a marathon and not a sprint. Renjiro didn't know, but his actions in the Chunin exams finals would have a huge ripple in time, causing one of the Kanoha 11 to have a whole different life. For the change that was to come, we will just have to wait and see. By the time Renjiro got his final chance to challenge someone, Renjiro was in rank 5, Hiro in rank 6 while Aiko was in rank 9. Something that made Riku boast to his colleagues. Not only were his genins in the last stage of the exam, but they were potentially going to finish among the best 10. With all eyes on him, Renjiro finally expressed his choice for the final challenge. I want to challenge rank 1. The crowd went electric immediately they heard Renjiro challenging the top rank. Only 5 people were left with their last chance of ranking up. They also wanted to see why no one had challenged the first rank. He had not used his two chances since he had more to lose if he used them. This only made the crowd desperate to watch him get challenged. Surely being in the first rank meant that he was one of, if not, the strongest genin among the, the challengers. In the stands, Shimura Isagi, a jounin, remarked, Why did your nephew challenge him, Miwa? He might be good, but from what I have seen, he might not win. Miwa, on the other hand, just smiled. How did you expect to see much from him when no one has pushed him to a wall? You have always spoken highly of that boy, so I am sure this is going to be a good battle. Back at the platforms, a brown-headed boy just humped as he followed Renjiro to the arena. His name was Shimura Tenko. He did not outrightly use intimidation on his fellow genins to ensure he did not get any challenges coming his way, but his reputation did create a similar effect. If Tenko wanted, he would have participated in the previous Chunin exams and even passed, but he was advised not to and forced to follow a path laid out by his father so that he could make a name for himself during this iteration of the exam. So far, everything had gone according to plan. He had been among the first teams to clear the Forest of Death days prior to the deadline. He also easily won his three matches in the preliminaries earning his rank. He was almost going to finish the finals without receiving a challenge until Renjiro challenged him. He had seen Renjiro's previous matches and wasn't really impressed. Either way, winning this match would still ensure that my objective will be met. Meanwhile, Renjiro was perplexed. Tenko Shimura. Why does the name sound familiar, it seems like I am forgetting something. Begin. With the signal given, both sprang into action heading towards each other. Bam. Both genins clashed as their fists met they then jumped back. It was clear that they were probing one another. He is strong. Now I remember why the name sounded familiar. He was the guy the academy instructors were calling a prodigy. He had graduated before I enrolled but the instructors still praised him. I am sure he is a capable shinobi, but he is no Itachi. Tenku did not waste more time and closed in on Renjiro while throwing a left hook. Renjiro ducked and counteracted with a sweeping kick intending to sweep Tenko off his feet. Unfortunately, Tenku sees the attack and he does a backflip while throwing five kunais at Renjiro. Instead of dodging, Renjiro grabbed the moving kunais in pairs and redirected them back to their sender. Tenku uses a kunai he was holding to deflect the incoming projectiles. I was wondering why no one challenged you. I thought you were strong, but I guess the rest were cowards. Renjiro knew that a fight was as much mental as it was physical. Taunting his opponents was not beneath him because gaining an inching in a mental exchange would make the fight easier for him. Tenku's face darkened as he heard Renjiro, but after a moment it reverted to his previous expression. He has good control. Renjiro thought. Don't worry, let me enlighten you, Tenku said as four shadow clones appeared next to him. All clones of him headed towards him. Renjiro tilted his head as he dodged the clone holding a kunai. He flipped backwards while throwing, dispelling the clone. While he was in the air, he got a hold of the nape of the other two clones intending to shove their head to the ground as he landed, but it seemed that Tenku had other plans. The original Tenku smirked as Renjiro was met with a blinding light. Just as his feet were inches to the ground, the two clones he was holding exploded. 
The impact of the explosion sent Renjiro crashing to the ground twice in succession before rolling. What just dash, Renjiro did not have time to express his shock as he opened his eyes to a view of Tenku in the air directly above him. His foot was outstretched clearly targeting Renjiro's abdomen. Tenku shouted, wind barrage. Quickly gathering himself, Renjiro rolled to the side as he avoided the kick and turned his head. What he saw shocked him. A couple of meters away from him, there were cracks on the ground. Did he do that with his foot? No, he must have used a wind jutsu to reinforce his foot. After concluding the most likely case, Renjiro quickly rose and flickered a meter away. Tenku did not give Renjiro any moment to breathe as he appeared behind him attacking with a kunai. Renjiro tilted his head avoiding the strike, but Tenku retracted his arm and hit Renjiro on his cheeks with his elbow. He followed with a kick to the side which Renjiro blocked with his arms. The Genins continued trading blows for a while until when Tenku had enough of it and jumped several meters back. Yes, they were trading blows, but none of Tenku's connected since Renjiro had fast reflexes. He, other the other hand, received the full brunt of a majority of Renjiro's strikes. He had always been proud of his physique but it seemed to be made of iron. What? Is this too much for you? Renjiro said with a taunting smile. Tenku scoffed and retrieved a shuriken which he threw towards Renjiro's direction. As the shuriken neared, Tenku made a hand sign and five more similar appeared. From the trajectory, Renjiro concluded that Tenku was targeting his head and limbs. I have to dodge this. Renjiro jumped, almost making a split in the air. He also moved his head leaving him in an unnatural position in the air which Tenku took advantage of. He appeared behind Renjiro and shouted, Infinite Breakthrough. Renjiro was pushed by winds to the nearest wall surrounding the arena. He crashed into the wall but he did not take long before he regained composure and headed towards Tenku. Tenku repeated the jutsu sending him back crashing at the same wall. This time he did not get up. Is this how Hiro felt? Because it is really annoying, he thought as Tenku was meters from him. Renjiro turned his head and used Jinjutsu on Tenku. At least that is what he thought, but Tenku just scoffed and said, I was getting lessons on how to avoid Jinjutsu even before I got into the academy, what makes you think that your attempt will succeed? Tenku spammed the infinite breakthrough again. Since Renjiro was already close to the wall, he took the full brunt of the attack. Immediately the wind stopped, a shadow clone appeared next to Renjiro. With a hand sign from both him and the shadow clone, Renjiro used his first combination jutsu. Flame wave. Wind wave. Tenku widened his eyes as the wind and flame expelled by Renjiro combined and exploded right in front of him. The impact took Tenku from one end of the arena to another. Tenku's figure flailed in the air like a ragdoll as he covered the arena's diameter, crushing into the wall. Cheers echoes around the arena. This was by far the most entertaining fight the village had seen the whole day. That was oddly satisfying, Renjiro muttered as take a moment to gather himself, something he would regret soon. I agree that you might be good, by other standards, next time choose your battles well. Tenku began making hand signs. What is he on about dash, Renjiro's instincts flared as Tenku finished preparing his jutsu. Back in the podium above them, Hiruzen turned to the man sitting beside him and asked, Danzo, why would you teach a genin such a dangerous jutsu? Danzo failed to answer Herzuin, but a frown still appeared on his face. What is wrong with this boy? He wasn't supposed to use the set of jutsus. Hiruzen was not the only one alarmed, all experienced shinobi who saw him in the second war were also alarmed. Daichi also furrowed his brows at the scene but decided not to do anything about it. The same could not be said for Fugaku who was sitting beside his father. He couldn't help but yell, is he trying to kill him? His outburst only garnered looks from the other clan head sitting around them. Cool down Fugaku, your behavior is not befitting of the future Uchiha clan head. Also, have some faith in Renjiro. Back on the stage, Tenku shouted, wind release, vacuum bullets. He used one of his father's signature jutsus. The vacuum jutsus developed by Danzo was among the most destructive wind jutsus ever created. To learn jutsus of such caliber just showed how Tenku was talented as well as dangerous. Despite having a considerable distance between them, Renjiro still found it difficult to dodge the bullets. The bullets were moving at high speeds as Tenku continued to shoot the bullets from his mouth. Shit! 
one of the bullets grazed Renjiro's left thigh. At first, he thought that the bullet only left behind a shallow wound, but with the amount of blood dyeing his pants red, he knew there was more to the wound. This is dangerous. Seeing that he could dodge other bullets heading his way, a shadow clone appeared in front of Renjiro. The shadow clone took the full brunt of the attack. Before it was dispelled, Renjiro stepped on it to jump higher to avoid other bullets. This is my chance. Once Renjiro landed, he realized that Tenku had stopped releasing the bullets and was panting. Clearly, releasing such attacks was taking a toll on him. Just give up. Tenku urged as he threw a punch at Renjiro. Now why would I do that? Renjiro retorted. Fine, don't say you weren't warned. Tenku took a deep breath as he used another wind vacuum jutsu, vacuum wave. This time, Renjiro was prepared. He moved his abdomen and took a crab-like stance as he dodged the wave. Before Tenku could adjust his target, Renjiro shifted his weight to his hands. Using his legs he clasped Tenku on the neck and performed the scissor takedown on him. Tenku slammed hard on the ground. As he got up to his feet, he was visibly disoriented and staggered for a moment. Tenku tried to get his bearing, only to hear voices around his shout. Flame wave, wind wave, flame wave, wind wave, Renjiro had made three more shadow clones and repeated his previous attack. Tenku crashed into the same hole in the wall Renjiro did a few minutes ago. Renjiro and his clones flickered next to him, but Tenku was quick and released a vacuum jutsu that dispelled the clones and blew Renjiro away. The jutsu slashed on Renjiro, piercing his skin and dyeing his whole outfit red. Wind release, vacuum serial waves. Tenku muttered, he barely had enough energy left and was just holding on. Why doesn't he just stay down? Tenku lamented on seeing Renjiro get up. Tenku wanted to repeat the same thing, but Renjiro was quicker and punched him, disrupting the flow of chakra for his next jutsu. You sure like blasting those jutsus. I guess I should also try them. You bastard. Tenku tried to punch Renjiro. Instead of dodging, Renjiro redirected it and their hands met. Not in the romantic sense, but they performed the rat seal. Tenku continued throwing punches and only became aware of what Renjiro was doing after they completed the fourth hand sign and Renjiro said, here's your enlightenment, vacuum serial waves. For a moment, there was a pin drop silence in the arena as the vacuum waves caught Tenku at point blank range. They also made deep cuts on him, gifting him with the same treatment he dished at Renjiro a few minutes prior. How did Renjiro perform the same jutsu that Tenku did a few minutes prior? It's pretty simple. From the first time Tenku used the vacuum bullets jutsu, Renjiro's keen eyes caught a minute detail. Tenku had not really mastered the jutsu, otherwise, why would he need more than four signs to actually perform it? Is he Danzo's son? Still, this is good. If he already knows one vacuum jutsu, then if I push him, he might show me more. These jutsus are the premium wind jutsus in Konoha. I am not sure if I'll ever see Danzo or someone else use them again, so I better utilize this opportunity. Renjiro schemed. When Tenku used the vacuum serial waves, Renjiro was elated. Even as he lay there with cuts all over his body, he was contented. Once Renjiro knew he couldn't keep pushing Tenku, he decided to take a gamble and try out the jutsu. It was a risky idea, but it paid off as he flawlessly performed the jutsu with him only receiving minor wounds on his arms as a drawback. Fortunately or unfortunately, he had already received far worse wounds from the fight for the drawback to matter. Back to the present, Tenku crashed into the ground and lost his consciousness. At that time, the proctor's voice echoes out in the arena. Winner, Uzumaki Renjiro. Yeah. The crowd roared as the match was concluded. A challenger had won against the top rank. Renjiro effectively became rank 1 while Tenku dropped to rank 5. Finally, Renjiro said as he dropped to the ground. He did not collapse, he just sat there. I actually enjoyed that. He thought as medic needs rushed into Tenku and Renjiro and attended to both of them. After a few minutes of medical ninjutsu, Renjiro made his way to the platforms. Tenku was in a worse condition so he did not return. With only four people left who could still issue a challenge, the ceremony was bound to end soon. Rank 4, 3 and 2 did not issue any challenge as they were contented with their current ranks. Tenku still had a chance to issue a challenge, but since he was out of commission, the Chunin final exams concluded. 
While most people liked how the finals ended, Danzo was mad. After all that planning, this boy showed his whole hand to the village and still lost. Daichi and Fugaku were happy because this brought honor to the Uchiha clan, despite Renjiro not bearing their name. It was an open secret he was one of them. Miwa even got to have a satisfying, I told you so moment, with her colleague. Whether it was positive or negative, none of those emotions would change what had happened. With the ranking finalized, the top 20 genins from the initial 32 were called forward and the Hokage declared that they were now Chunins of Konoha and the Land of Fire in general. The initial plan was to promote only half the number of genins but rank 17 to 20 showed exceptional promise that Hiruzen decided to promote them since the village was in dire need of them as a gesture, the daimyo who was still present was asked to hand the former genins their new green flak jackets to signify their rank promotion. Every one of the new chunins was on cloud 9 as this was what they had been working hard for the last month if you counted their final preparations. For Uzumaki Renjiro, this was only the second step in the dangerous path he had decided to tread. So, do you know what you will do after this? Fugaku inquired to the young chunin walking beside him. No, at least not yet. I have been looking at the options I have and I am still to make a decision. Besides, I have one year to do so, so after this, my path would be clear. Renjiro answered. If that is the case, then just know that on behalf of the force, I know we would really like someone as talented as you, the Jounin remarked as their destination came into view. Their destination was the Kanoha police force. It was safe to say it was more of the Uchiha police force since it was the clan running the organization in the village. The last week has been a roller coaster for Renjiro. After the finals, he celebrated with his teammates, Miwa and Kushina. Riku even took them out for a meal as he formally ended their three-man team. It was not that bad, as he reassured them that if they ever needed help, they were free to get in touch with him. When asked about his future plans, Riku, just like Renjiro, was not sure. I am still thinking of taking up another team since I was only a Jounin sensei for close to two years. If Lord Third has some good missions I might return to the field. Riku said. Hiro and Aiko decided that they would still continue taking on missions and had already started looking for teams they could work with. Having trustworthy allies would really help in the field. Aiko had the short end of the stick with this as compared to Hiro. Hiro would just transition from their genin team to a chunin one made by his clansmen. Aiko however, would need to try an error to find a team that utilizes her skills to afford her room to grow. Good thing both Riku, Renjiro, and Hiro offered to recommend her whenever teams from their clans need someone of her expertise. For Renjiro, things were different. Just like every Uchiha, he would have to serve in the Uchiha police force or UPS, in short. When Renjiro first heard Daichi mention this, he wanted to leave. He had already heard him mention this right before his first meeting with the other clan members but really didn't think much of it. After ascending to the Chunin rank, he realized this was more serious than he had earlier thought. He immediately wanted to leave the clan because why would he want to serve in the police force? But after careful consideration, he decided not to. There were still some resources that he needed from the clan. One of them was the meditation rooms with the chakra crystals. Renjiro was still improving his chakra nature affinities and he even started using the lightning and earth rooms despite his progress on them being abysmal. I am still a Chunin, so getting access to such a resource would be hard. Besides joining the Umbu, which is pretty unlikely because no Uchiha has ever been recruited, I don't think there is any way I can access them. I know I am not an Uchiha by name, but I am sure the prejudice would still follow me around by association and because of my eyes. The other reason Renjiro could not live the Uchiha clan was that leaving would sour the relations he had with the clan. He was sure that they would not outrightly consider him an enemy, but they were really influential in the village. Besides, you never know where having good relations with such a strong clan would take you. You would most likely gain more than you would lose. At this point, I think I should have just changed my name from Uzumaki to Uchiha. Uchiha Renjiro, I would how that would have felt, it probably be badass. We have arrived. I will take you to someone who will help you, settle in, Fugaku said as they entered a compound Renjiro would only describe as the mini-clan compound. Well, that did not sound ominous at all. The duo quickly made their way across the largest building in view and stopped when they reached a room on one of the floors. Fugaku let himself in. 
Rinjiro quickly followed his lead and entered the room. All eyes immediately fell on the new entrance making Rinjiro feel a bit weird. Not because he was shy, but because some of the gazes he received were from Sharingans. Hmm? Why are they using their Sharingans on me? Rinjiro thought as his brows furrowed. He felt a prickly sensation pass over him that he had difficulty in explaining. Fujioka, I have brought a guest, the clan head recommended him to join your squad since, you know, you lost a man recently, Fugaku said to a man who was standing in the middle of the room. Judging from the way he was standing with how he was standing while the rest were sitting, it was clear he had been addressing the rest when Fugaku and Renjiro entered the room. Ah! Fugaku, it has been long since I saw you on these sides, how is Daichi doing? We have been busy out of the village for some time so I might not be caught up in recent events, Achiha Fujioka replied. The clan head is doing just fine, Fugaku said as he turned towards Renjiro and continued, This is Uzumaki Renjiro. He has recently become a chunin, so he is here for his mandatory service. Missions? Isn't this the police force? I thought that their work was just patrolling. Although if that was the case it would be a massive oversight from Haruzen if he can find such strong shinobi to such menial works. Renjiro surmised. Uzumaki, one of the four other shinobi in the room asked. Yes, Tobe. With his hair, I was hoping that it would be obvious. But it seems you need more time to realize it don't worry, I believe in you, another shinobi, who bore a close resemblance to the first one replied. You bastard. We are basically the same person. I don't know why you like acting smart. Tobe replied. All right, come down you idiots. Thank you for bringing Renjiro, Fugaku. I will catch him to speed. Send my greetings to your father when you return. I will take my leave now Renjiro. I am sure Fujioka will take care of you. Fugaku said before he left. Boy, how much do you know about the police force? Fujioka asked. I only know that they are responsible for the peace and order in the village, Renjiro answered. Is that all? Yes. TCH. I thought that since Fugaku personally brought you out here, you would already know more. Anyway, hey bring him up to speed with what we do, I need to go and handle something else, as Fujioka walked out of the room, a kunoichi in the room approached Renjiro. Hello Renjiro, my name is Achiha Hei. I am still Chunin just like you. It seems that we will be in the same squad from now on. Then I'll be in your care, Renjiro said as he made a slight bow. That's good. I think before we start, everyone should introduce themselves. Hei said to her squad mates. My name is Achiha Tobe and I am going to be the next Hokage, one of the other shinobi said. Leave my brother alone, my name is Achiha Toda. So they are brothers. They really look alike, almost like twins. Maybe they are. My name is Achiha Kagami, I know you are probably wondering why my name is so familiar, it's because my grandfather was a very powerful dash, he wasn't born in Kanoha, you idiot. How would he even know your grandfather? Hey interrupted Kagami. Way to make that obvious, it's almost like your contribution to the plot would pass me with your future wife here. Renjiro shook his head when he witnessed the scene before him. Alright, Renjiro, let's go over the duties of the Uchiha police force, Hei began, her tone serious yet measured. First and foremost, we're responsible for patrolling our village. This means keeping a watchful eye on the streets of Kanoha, ensuring the safety of all its civilians. Renjiro nodded, understood, he replied. Next, we're tasked with peacekeeping, Hei continued. This includes resolving disputes, diffusing tense situations, and generally maintaining order within the village. Renjiro furrowed his brow slightly, what did I sign up for? I am wasting a whole year that I could use to grow in strength. But oh well, the decision has already been made, there's no going back, he thought. Our duties don't stop there. We are also responsible for investigations. When crimes are committed, it is our job to gather evidence, interview witnesses, and piece together what happened. Investigations make sense, Renjiro commented. What about locking up the criminals? That's another one of our responsibilities, Hei replied. When we identify suspects and gather enough evidence, we're authorized to make arrests and bring them in for questioning. Renjiro took a mental note, understanding the gravity of the task at hand. And what about crimes committed by other shinobi, he inquired. We also lock them up if need be unless those guys come in, Kagami added. Those guys? 
Renjiro inquired. Don't worry about that, I doubt you will barely even interact with them while you are here, Hei quickly added. It was clear she wanted to veer off the topic that Kagami had introduced. What or who are you guys referring to? There is no need to hide it Hei. Even if he doesn't interact with them he will soon hear about it in the clan, Tota began, Kagami was talking about the Umbu and Root. I am not sure if you know this or not, but they work under the Hokage and one of the council elders. Before, they would only handle investigations for special cases, but nowadays it seems like they are taking most of our responsibilities. Tota said. Ooh, so it has already started. I thought that the phasing out would start after the third war and just before the Ninetales attack. If it started this early, then maybe the Uchiha clan were right to plan a coup, because this was only going to get worse. Stop giving the boy a false perspective, Tota. The Umbu and Root just handle most of the special cases, that's the end of it. Tobe said. Was anything I said wrong? I am just calling it how it is. One day, they might even want us out of this village. Dola Stauti. He doesn't know how close to the truth he is, but that's far into the future, I might need to get involved because with the help of the Uchiha maybe the fourth shinobi war won't have that many casualties. Enough said about that, no we need to talk about the hierarchy of the force, Hei said as Toda and Tobe were off bickering for the second time since Renjiro arrived. The ranks are pretty straightforward. Every squad has five members and they all answer to the squad leader, Uchiha Fujioka, in our case. The squad leaders, in turn, answer to a squad captain who is responsible for 10 squads. The squad captains answer to the commanders who answer to the head who is the clan head. You have already met one of the forces commanders. Who? Renjiro questioned. You came in with Fugaku. Besides being the clan head son, he is also already an experienced Jounin so it is understandable that he is one of the three police commanders. Kagami said. He is already just a level below Daichi at that age? I guess he became the Uchiha clan head in the future because of his power and not due to his lineage. Yes, as Kagami said, Uchiha Fugaku is one of the three commanders of the force. The three commanders all have three squad captains under them meaning that there are ten squad captains in total if you consider the squad captain of those from the Genin reserve. I always thought that the police force was entirely made up of the Uchiha clan, but it made sense for some genins from the reserve to be added to be recruited. That said a squad captain is more or less in charge of 60 officers, with them being 10, that is around 600 people enlisted to force. It might not be a large number, but when you take into account the fact that chakra makes them superhumans, then the force becomes a deadly force. That reminds me, even among us normal shinobi officers, there are still ranks. There are initiates, what you currently are, is the lowest followed by the fourth rank all the way to the first rank. The first rank is directly under the squad leader. Kagami is in the first rank while those two and I are in the second rank. What is the use of all these ranks? Renjiro asked. They determine the responsibilities one can handle as well as who can be promoted, Hei answered. I thought that the normal shinobi ranks determine that, Renjiro commented. They do, but other factors are also considered. For instance, your leadership and strategic capabilities are more valued as the force is set up in such a way that during wartime, it directly transitions to a military force. But that is only for the positions of squad captains and below. The commanders and above have to be Jounins while the squad captains can either be a Jounin, elite Jounin or even a Chunin in some cases. Tobe added. That makes sense. Okay I get it. But I do have a question, you are free to ask, Renjiro, Hei said, do all the Uchiha members in force not take any missions from the center? That is why we are grouped into squads, Renjiro. Besides during wars, squads take missions in turns as all other clans in the village. However, unlike other clans, the quota in which we take B ranks and above is low. Why? We are one of the founding clans of the village, so it is our utmost duty to focus more on protecting the village than taking up missions. This time Kagami added in a serious tone. Well, that sucks. Noticing the look on Renjiro's face Hei said, the number of times, we take up missions is solely at the discretion of the squad leader, so with you here, we might take more missions than usual to help you become an experienced shinobi. Yes, I'd really appreciate that, Renjiro said with his face beaming. 
I see Hei has already filled you in, a voice interrupted them as everyone's gaze fell on the door where Fujioka was standing. Here is your identification and your schedule. You will be required to meet here every day to train with us so as to increase our teamwork as well as patrol the village with other initiates like yourself. Renjiro took the bunch of papers that Fujioka handed him and thanked him. After that, Renjiro was free to go wherever he wanted since it was a couple of hours before dusk when his shift would start. Thinking of what to do, Renjiro decided to visit Kushin to go through some seals, he had just learned. Good afternoon, Kushina, Renjiro said immediately arriving at the, the Jinchuriki's place. What did I tell you to call me? Kushina said, Usari Sensei, forgive this lowly one, I heard that you have gone to the police force, how is it? Today was my first day, so I can't really say how it is. Hopefully, I will still have time to continue with my training. I remember when I became a Chunin, those were good times. Why are you talking as if it was a long time ago? I'll have you know that even though I am an elite Jounin, I can take on most Jounins and above in Kanoha, Kushina said puffing up her chest. That reminds me, I think it's time I teach a special technique we used to learn back in Yuzushio, what technique? Have you ever heard of something called Chakra Senu? Is she going to say what I'm thinking? No, what is it? As I told you earlier, Uzumakis are known to have a strong resilient chakra. This part of our beings allows us to use some chakra abilities. Kushina paused to see if Renjiro was keenly listening before continuing, I had lost hope when I heard that you had awakened the Sharingan. I had thought that your mother's genes were more dominant, but after witnessing your large chakra reserves as well as your stamina even when making seals, I concluded that maybe you might be able to unlock your body to accommodate the chakra senu. It was as I thought. I've been waiting for this. Wait, unlock? How do I unlock it? And do you have any of these chakra abilities? I do have one, it's geared more toward sealing, but it can be used for combat to some extent. As for unlocking the chakra senu, I need to perform a jutsu on your body so that you can accommodate the ability. Think of the ability as a kekiai genkai, your body must change to accommodate the ability whether it be changing chakra nature for elemental kekiai genkai or changing a particular physical aspect in the case of the uchiha and the sharingan. So when you do this jutsu, will I awaken an ability immediately or what will happen? Also, if I do awaken an ability, will it be a random one or will I get to choose it? Once I perform the jutsu on you, your body will be free to pick up any abilities taught and can even awaken one of its own. As for the ability, just like a kekiai genkai, I can teach you the ability I have or any of the others that I know to awaken. Alright, I think I have gotten a better understanding of this whole thing. When can we begin? Renjiro asked. Do you want to do it now? Kushina asked with a puzzled look. How long will it take? The time it takes varies from person to person, but considering only your father was an Uzumaki and a civilian at that, it would probably take closer to a day for you. Hmm, that long. I guess we can begin tomorrow after I finish my shift and training. Do I need to make any special preparations? None whatsoever, I am the one who needs to do most of the preparations. Alright, then I will come back tomorrow then, Renjiro said and left for his house as he had to start his duty in the police force. I guess I was wrong, maybe I will learn a lot during this next year in the force. Still, if I can awaken the adamant and sealing chains, then I might become an elite jounin faster than I had planned. But which skill would be better? Kushina's chains or Karen's healing and sensing abilities? If I had to have my pick, I would pick all three of them, but I am sure it won't be possible. Anyway, I should stop wasting time thinking about it, all I know is that whatever ability I awaken will help me in the long run. Rinjiro stopped thinking out loud just as he reached his compound. He had several hours remaining, so he decided to make a few seals before going to the meditation rooms to meditate. When it was almost dusk, Renjiro made his way to the police base and began his shift patrolling the village. It was then that Renjiro realized that this work might not be bad after all. By patrolling the village, he got access to several places that he wouldn't have gotten unless he became an S-rank shinobi or even a council member. He now knew where important facilities in the village were such as the intelligence division which was quite close to the police base in the outskirts of the village. He also got to know the various residencies of the clans living in Kanoha, but the locations that Renjiro deemed important were the bases of the Umbu and the Root. Of course, 
He could not snoop around them because he was just a normal Chunin in the police force. Also from his talk with his squad earlier in the day, he concluded that the Root, Umbu, and the police force were not in the best of terms. Due to the volatile situation, he needed to be surgical in his actions towards those three forces or he could risk things deteriorating and force the Uchiha clan to a worse position than they already were. Other than noting down these few places of interest, Renjiro's first shift was uneventful. He made a few friends here and there, but it was nothing worth mentioning. Staying around Sora, Kaido, Tekka, Inabi and the rest made me forget how few Uchihas awaken their Sharingan. At least, they are good when it comes to fire-style jutsus. But just imagining living without the Sharingan would be like fighting with your dominant hand tied in the back. But that gives me an idea, I should try to collect their eyes during the next war to see whether I can artificially awaken their Sharingans using Fuin Jutsu or even Kinjutsu. That would be a good way to know how I can awaken my Mangekyo without the whole curse of hatred nonsense. Renjiro went to his squad training session where they had a physical training session followed by a tactical training. The physical session was nothing much as Renjiro's stamina was growing day by day that he had to get new weights because the current one was becoming light even after using it to its full potential. During the next session, Fujioka made it clear that they would not change things because Renjiro just joined the squad. He was already a chunin, so he could catch up by learning from the rest. With his day, or night, done, Renjiro arrived at Kushina's place for the awakening. He felt fresh the whole day but still decided to have a power nap just in case. Are you ready? Kushina asked. Yes, I am. What do I need to do? He inquired. No, you just need to strip and lay down here, Kushina said as she pointed to the bed that she had prepared beforehand. What? I need to strip? Kushina noticed the hesitation on Renjiro's face and added, all your tenketsu need to be free for the whole process to succeed. This assured Renjiro and he promptly stripped down. He was only left with a pair of shorts on his being. After lying down on the bed, Kushina began, the jutsu I am going to use was usually done during the coming of age of all Yuzushio shinobi and Fuin jutsu experts. It was done earlier in their life so it might be a bit painful for you since you are older and your body has already formed certain habits. The best case scenario is that you gain better regeneration ability for your chakra and body and even awaken an ability of your own. The worst case scenario is that you might lose the ability to wield chakra since this is the first time I am performing this jutsu after Mido-san taught me. What do Dash Kushina muttered the last part, but Renjiro still managed to hear it. He wanted to reply when Kushina completed her hand signs and infused her chakra to most of Renjiro's tenketsu. Renjiro's eyes dilated as a blanket of pain enveloped his whole being. Up to now, the most pain he had ever felt was when Kushina mistakenly used the advanced chakra drain seal on him. Was this a jutsu or a ritual? He thought as he struggled not to lose his consciousness. The jutsu, or ritual as Renjiro had termed it, that Kushina was using was called Magatama. It directly translated to vitality. The Jutsu was a manifestation of the inherent strength and resilience of the Uzumaki clan. When performed, it bathed the target in a radiant aura of swirling chakra, imbuing them with enhanced vitality and fortitude. The Jutsu worked by tapping into the unique energy available in the Uzumaki bloodline, channeling it throughout the target's body to bolster their physical and spiritual capabilities. As a shimmering aura of crimson and gold appeared, the pain that Renjiro was experiencing seemed to increase exponentially. The aura radiated outward from Renjiro's body in undulating waves, creating a protective barrier that surrounded both him and Kushina like a cocoon of energy. Renjiro, I know that you are in pain, but I want to try to assimilate the chakra for as long as you can, Kushina said to the near-unconscious Chunin lying before her. Renjiro didn't know how, but he did as directed and began trying to assimilate the chakra he was getting from Kushina. Fortunately, it offered some respite as the pain dulled. He was still feeling pain, but it was at least more manageable than before. That is good, Renjiro. Keep circulating your chakra in your body. Renjiro kept on circulating his chakra as the crimson aura surrounding them began to dull. Now we have completed the first phase, Renjiro. For this next one, just try your best to stay awake. Immediately Kushina finished talking, she used her left hand to perform a hand sign and slammed it onto Renjiro's navel region. 
This was followed by a surge of power that started coursing through Renjiro's veins, invigorating him from within. If before he was feeling hot steam coursing through him, it now felt like molten lava was coursing through him. It was not like Renjiro had ever experienced the temperatures, but he could swear this was how it felt. Immediately, drops of sweat began forming on his forehead and Renjiro could not help but start squirming from the pain. He bit his lips so hard that they started to bleed. We are not going to get good results if he keeps on moving. Kushina thought as she began channeling her chakra. With a focused intensity in her eyes, the air around her began to crackle with energy as adamantin chains materialized from her torso. Gleaming with an otherworldly luminescence, the chain snaked forth from her body with fluid grace and wrapped around Renjiro. With Rejiro in place, Kushina continued infusing more and more chakra into Renjiro. Renjiro could no longer move, but his muscles started spasming as he was now drenched in sweat. Hasn't he had enough? My reserves are almost half depleted. That is more than half of his total chakra and yet his tenketsus aren't showing any signs of filling up. Anyway, I have more chakra to spare, so I'll just continue going on for a while. I am sure that the more chakra Renjiro gets, the more chances he has of awakening an ability. Two more hours passed with Kushina still infusing chakra to Renjiro. Renjiro was in a near comatose state where he was aware of what was happening, but he couldn't move. It was like he was dreaming and fighting sleep paralysis at the same time. On top of that, his eyes were stinging him. Meanwhile, Kushina had begun thinking of other things when a shiver passing through her brought her out of her reverie. Wait, what is happening? Renjiro's eyes are bleeding, has his body reached the threshold? Kushina did a quick check on Renjiro's body and apart from his eyes bleeding, nothing else was different. Well, that was until Kushina noticed the glow on her hands. What have I done? Renjiro has had enough. I should stop before things get bad for both him and me. As Kushina noticed the orange glow on her hands instead of the previous blue one, Renjiro's eyes, which were still bleeding, were reacting differently to the new chakra entering his chakra network. His three tomo were spinning rapidly. Just as they were about to stop and take shape, they reverted back to normal. This was because Kushina had stopped the chakra infusion. We have completed the process, Renjiro. You can now rest. Kushina said as Renjiro finally threw in the towel and fainted. I have used more chakra than I expected. I even used that guy's chakra and I still couldn't reach the threshold. This is a good sign, but I hope using the Kyubi's chakra will not have adverse effects on Renjiro. Kushina sat down in a lotus position and began to meditate. She tapped into the Nine Tails chakra so she had to regain more of her chakra as fast as possible to ensure the QB did not comprise the seal. Although she could still handle things even if the QB decided to escape, it would complicate a lot of things and even disrupt Renjiro, who was still recovering from the Magatama Jutsu. Fortunately, Kushina's high chakra regeneration kicked in and after some minutes, her chakra reserves completely filled up. She got up and decided to wait until Renjiro woke up. Renjiro's eyes fluttered open, blinking away the remnants of sleep. He expected to wake up feeling groggy and disoriented as he did from another incident in the past. However, he felt better than ever. It was as if every cell in his body had been revitalized, replenishing him from within. With a deep inhale, Renjiro stretched his limbs. I feel good. It's like I have had the best sleep in my two lifetimes. As he rose from his bed, Renjiro realized that he was still in his pair of shorts and now had blood stains all over his body. How are feeling, Renjiro? Kushina asked as she approached Renjiro. Before Renjiro could answer, she placed a hand on Renjiro's shoulder. What is she doing? Wait, was she always this short? Renjiro wondered. Kushina's brows furrowed as she asked, are you okay? Renjiro nodded, are you feeling anything now? No, he said before his eyes widened and he asked, are you trying to infuse your chakra to me? I thought we were already done with the process? Kushina did not answer and just walked to a table near her and retrieved a seal. She then walked towards Renjiro holding the seal. Renjiro immediately backed away. What are you doing? He asked. What is wrong? Why are you holding that seal? Renjiro said pointing to the seal on her hand. I want to use it on you. Kushina answered. Why? It is an inspect seal. I want to use it to see if there are any other changes to your body. Are you sure that it is the right seal? 
Yes, why? Kushina asked with a perplexed look on her face. You have already mistaken a seal you wanted to use on me once, so I just wanted to make sure it doesn't repeat, Renjiro answered as he sighed. Ooh, so that's why you are alarmed, don't worry, I have already checked if it is the right seal. Renjiro relaxed as Kushina placed the seal on his top left chest. Renjiro sat as Kushina did more tests on him. She even used more seals on him. He did not know what exactly she did, but Renjiro chose to trust her. Kushina even used a needle on his finger to draw some of his blood. He noticed the bleeding stop immediately Kushina drew the blood which was strange. Instead of wasting time thinking about it, let me just wait for Kushina to finish up her experiments. So, are you done? Renjiro inquired. Yes, Kushina nodded as she took a seat in front of him. What is the conclusion? Kushina smiled as she said, the process was a success. Everything happened as planned and you might have even awakened an ability. What do you mean by, might, are you not sure about it? Renjiro asked. In a span of a few seconds, he went through a lot of emotions. First, he was happy with the prospect of him awakening an ability. Any tool that he could add to his arsenal was very much welcomed. Then when he realized that Kushina had used the word, might, he became unsure. Is she not sure of it or was there an issue? He wondered. I am not really sure about it, Kushina began, when you woke up, I immediately tried to use my chakra to inspect the changes your body has experienced. But I only felt like you were trying to infuse your chakra into me. Was that not the purpose? Renjiro asked with a questioning look. No, it wasn't, and that's exactly the problem. As soon as my chakra entered your body, I lost control of it, Kushina paused and gave more thought to it before continuing, it was more like it dissipated. But you use more seals after the inspect one on me, didn't they give you a better look at the situation? Renjiro asked with an empty stare. Yes, the seals did help, but only to some extent. I only confirmed that your regeneration capabilities have increased, but I am sure you have already realized that. Yes, Renjiro nodded and began, I feel like my chakra reserves have nearly tripled, and the rate at which I can regenerate chakra has increased. I also noticed when you drew my blood that the bleeding almost immediately stopped. Yes, while your new regeneration capability is good, you need to take care. You are not able to regenerate muscles and limbs instantly, you just heal faster. Alright, got it, Renjiro said with a nod. But back to the matter at hand. You said that you weren't able to inspect my body using your chakra. Is this something that you come across before? Renjiro inquired. This whole matter had been troubling him for the last few minutes. Yes, he might have awakened an ability, which was great, but knowing about it would be better. Now that I think about it, I think I have ever heard about it, Kushina replied. Where? I remember when I was young, there was a boy older than me who awakened an ability that heard a similar effect, Kushina said as she scratched her head. It was clear she was trying to recall some of her earlier memories. What was the ability, Renjiro asked. It was some sort of chakra purification ability. He could purify any foreign substances entering his body. The minute the clan elders tried to examine his body after the Magatama, a similar situation to the one we just had occurred. So maybe I have awakened this chakra purification ability? Renjiro inquired. Yes, probably, Kushina replied. Well, that sucks. I thought that if I would awaken an ability it would be as useful as Karen's chakra healing or even Kushina's chains. The best this ability could do is probably ensure that I have immunity to poisons. Seeing the dejected look on Renjiro's face, Kushina decided to cheer him up, don't worry, Renjiro. It might not seem useful at first, but it could essentially make you immune to poison as most poisons, especially those made from Suna, since they are made using chakra. So you wouldn't have to fear when you encounter anyone from their especially puppet masters. I already thought of that. At least now I know that if I ever go against Sasari, his poisons won't be a threat to me. I am not sure if I will be safe from his human puppet jutsu. He does use chakra to turn people into puppets. As Renjiro was still thinking, a sudden idea flashed through his mind. Can I ask you a question? Sure, go ahead, the boy you mentioned, did you ever see him under a jinjutsu? No, why? Kushina asked not knowing where Renjiro was heading with this. I feel like if this ability makes one immune to foreign substances invading his system, chakra included, 
Then shouldn't he be immune to any Jinjutsu? I actually never thought of it. It basically works against the very concept of Jinjutsu, which is using your target's chakra to entrap them under an illusion. Kushina paused, but then if this was true, then why did he not tell anybody about it? Why would he? It was a card he could keep up in his sleeve if anyone used Jinjutsu to manipulate or attack him. Renjiro answered. True. Should we try and see whether Jinjutsu can now work on you? Kushina suggested. We don't really need to, Renjiro quickly shot the idea down. Not because he wasn't curious, but because he had trust in his Sharingan to detect instances when someone might try to use Jinjutsu on him. Come on, if we can prove that you are indeed immune to Jinjutsu, then we will be close to ascertaining if your ability is similar to Chakra Purification, Kushina begged. As I said, there is no need to. Besides, I have the Sharingan, so I am sure even if it failed, I would still not fall for your Jinjutsu, Renjiro said. Oh really? Kushina asked as a smirk formed on her lips. A cracking sound was heard followed by a loud noise. Kushina's chakra flared, as a deep orange, almost red, aura surrounded her, I think you are severely overestimating yourself Renjiro. The pressure that exuded Kushina was palpable and near suffocating. Renjiro even found his heart skipping a few beats while he drew in short breaths. Kushina then muttered, false surroundings. The chakra she was flaring all converged around Renjiro as his surroundings changed. As Kushina focused her chakra, a shimmering veil of illusion began to coalesce around them, enveloping them in a surreal dreamscape of shifting shadows and whispers. Wow, Renjiro couldn't help but blurt out as he saw the scene before him. This is a whole other level than the one Aiko used on me before. The Jinjutsu Kushina used was a relatively simple one that Renjiro encountered when he began practicing Jinjutsu. It was the very first Jinjutsu he learned, so of course he recognized it quickly. The difference between this and Aiko's is like day and night. It's like hers was 720p, while Kushina's is 4k. Is this the power of a Jinchuriki? If it is, then I want to be a Jinchuriki. Renjiro thought. He isn't reacting, so he has fallen for it. Humph. That's what you get for underestimating a Jinchuriki. Kushina thought as she humph out loudly. As soon as she did that, Renjiro changed his focus from the Jinjutsu to the lady in front of him. Does she really think that she has got me trapped in this Jinjutsu? Let's see how she handles this. Renjiro poured half of his chakra, which was more than what he had previously, into a Jinjutsu he was preparing and muttered, Mirror Heaven Earth Change. Yes, stating out my attack seems corny, but it is kinda addictive. Besides, I want to use a Jinjutsu on Kushina to teach her a lesson, so using half my chakra is not going overboard. She is a Jinchuriki, after all. What is he doing? Wait dash Kushina sensed Renjiro focusing his chakra and before she could realize what he was doing, her surroundings changed. But Kushina was not the only one experiencing a sudden change of surroundings, Renjiro was too. Where am I? Renjiro wondered as all he could see was a dark expanse. No, that was wrong, he couldn't see the darkness he could feel it. Just as he could feel the darkness, he felt what he could term as a condensation of negative emotions. Fear, anger, shame, sadness, the whole lot of it. It was like someone took their physical manifestation of it and made a cocktail out of it. The funny thing was that while this was spread around him, he could narrow it down to one direction, which he headed. Is that light? After what seemed like an eternity of walking blindly, Renjiro finally saw something. As he approached it he realized that it was a huge metallic gate with bars in between. The gate was imposing, its presence casting shadows in the already expanse surrounding it. Renjiro approached the gate with caution, despite the recent events unlocking a memory. With each step forward, he felt a palpable shift in the atmosphere, as if the very fabric of reality was bending to accommodate presence within this realm. As he pressed on and neared the gate, a being came into his view. It was Kurama, the nine-tailed fox. I should have guessed that I was in Kushina's subconscious. Rendro surmised. Kurama was having a boring day as usual. That had been the case ever since he got a new Jinchuriki. While it had been boring it was also very uncomfortable. While I also hated the lady before this brat, at least she was more considerate. As if locking me in their bodies was not enough, she even decided to bind me with her chains, I cannot even move. The nine-tailed fox thought. 
Kurama had been in a compromising position for the last few years. He had been happy when he felt Mito's life coming to an end even though he knew that she had prepared a successor. The person Mito had chosen was just a little girl, how would she be able to control him, the strongest tailed beast in the shinobi world? If only he knew the fate that awaited him, he would have wreaked havoc during the transfer ceremony. Kurama's thought process was that while Mito's seals were exceptional in containing him, his new host would not have enough willpower to keep up with him and would either lose control or herself in the process. Unfortunately for him, Uzumaki Kushina Uzumaki was not only able to contain him, but she was strong enough to bind him using her chains even in her subconscious mind. I was stupid in thinking that this brat could not handle me, but I won't repeat that mistake. The moment that I get an opportunity to escape I will do so with all my strength. She might be an Uzumaki, but she can't outlive me. I will just wait till she dies or even when she is giving birth to escape and have my revenge. Kurama lamented. As Kurama was in the midst of plotting his revenge and escape, something that he always did to keep himself sane, he felt another presence approaching. Um, what is this? As Renjiro neared, Kurama finally had the opportunity to examine him. Red hair? Is he related to that bra, wait, those eyes? As Kurama saw Renjiro's eyes, a shiver passed through him. It was the very eyes that had, and would, cause him problems and make him lose control of himself. Thank God that they are not the Mangekyo. Kurama side side. If this boy only had the Sharingan, then there wasn't much to be alarmed. Right across from him, Renjiro was in awe as he caught a glimpse of the nine-tailed fox, its massive form bound down by chains behind the doors. It was a sight that sent shivers down Renjiro's spine. The reaction was a result of being exposed to the beat's potent chakra as well as its very presence. As Renjiro was still taking in the presence before him, Kushina appeared right before him and said, you are not supposed to be here. Immediately after she said that Kushina forcefully expelled Renjiro out of her head. The result of this action was, of course, not good for Renjiro. He had channeled a significant amount of chakra in the Jinjutsu he used on Kushina, and the more he was in Kushina's subconscious, the more chakra he used. That coupled with the forceful expulsion by Kushina, resulted in a very sore headache for the Chunin. I feel like I have been hit by a truck, Renjiro said as he slightly bent holding his left knee with his left hand and used his right hand to massage his temple. What was that? Renjiro asked when he saw Kushina get up. I know exactly what that was, but I still have a path to play. I'm sorry about that, Kushina apologized. She didn't mean to use force against Renjiro, it was just out of instinct. Are you okay? She asked. I think so, Renjiro answered. Again, what was what? Renjiro repeated his earlier question. How, do I begin? Renjiro, how much do you know about tailed beasts? Not much other than the fact that Lord first distributed them amongst the five major shinobi villages, Renjiro answered. Renjiro couldn't say any more as more information about the tailed beasts and Jichirikis was not known to Chunin and below ranks. What you saw was the Kurama, the nine-tailed beast, gasp. You don't say. So, does that make you? Renjiro began. Yes, I am the Nine-Tails Jinchuriki, Kushina affirmed. Shin then went on to explain to Renjiro all about the Tailed Beasts and the Jinchurikis. It was information that Renjiro knew apart from the current Jinchurikis of some of the Tailed Beasts. So I guess, we can now confirm that you have the Chakra Purification ability, Kushina remarked. No, as I already told you, I only used my Sharingan. We can't know for sure whether I have it or not. Renjiro countered. But we could try using poison, Kushina suggested. No, no way. If I have the ability it would be good if it kicks in when my Sharingan fails, especially when I am against a Jinjutsu. But right now, I'm just fine with the upgrades my body has gone through, Renjiro said. Anyway, if you have that ability, you should be aware of one of its drawbacks, Kushina stated. Which are, the fact that the ability interferes with any foreign chakra means that you would never be healed using medical ninjutsu, Kushina said with her tone projecting finality. Wait, what? Rinjiro almost gasped in shock. I knew the ability sucked, I took my words back when I heard it could give me immunity against jinjutsus, but if medical ninjutsu can't work on me then this really sucks. He lamented. Yes. The chakra being used to heal you would be purified by your body and won't be able to heal you, Kushina stated. 
But why? Wouldn't the residual chakra that I get help to stimulate my cells and speed up the healing? Renjiro asked. Medical ninjutsu doesn't work that way, Renjiro, Kushina began, the chakra used is a unique one that stimulates cell regrowth. If normal chakra could suffice, then those with large chakra reserves could be near immortal. That makes sense. Renjiro thought. So from now on, I will have to solely rely on my improved regeneration? There's another idea I have, but I am not sure if it could work, Kushina said, you could try learning medical ninjutsu. Once your body recognizes the chakra, it would less likely try to purify it. Fair enough, I was already planning on getting into it, Renjiro replied. Then that sorts it, Kushina said with a clap. But enough about that, Renjiro began, before all these, you told me all about the various abilities you knew how to awaken. Yes, there are some that I was taught how to awaken when I was young. Did you awaken any of them? No, Kushina replied. Why? Because I felt that my adamant and chains were good enough for almost anything. Also, having too many of the abilities could start weighing down on your body. How? Your body is like a cup, the abilities would be water or any other liquid. If you pour too much into the cup, it will overpour. But in this case, your body will break down since the abilities are attached to your very being which is your soul. There have also been cases of people awakening other abilities during stressful situations, so if I learned them and awakened another one, things wouldn't be good for me considering that I am also a Jinchuriki. Just like Karen. Renjiro thought Renjiro nodded his head in agreement before asking, are you able to teach me another ability? As long as you are willing to take the risk, then yes, Kushina responded. But which one? My chains or the others? First, can I know the other abilities you know how to awaken? Renjiro asked. Kushina just walked towards a corner of the room where she retrieved a book. The information about them is all here, she said as she handed the book to Renjiro. I'd like to see whether there is some busted OP ability like the ones Kushina and Karen have. Renjiro thought. Renjiro took the book and did not hesitate to open it. As he opened it, Renjiro finally saw five abilities with their descriptions aptly noted down. His eyes quickly scanned the words written in the book. Only five, I thought they would be more. But then again, five seems like a weirdly average number. The first ability was Chakra Absorption. This ability would allow one to gain the ability to absorb and transfer chakra from others, effectively draining their energy to replenish their own reserves or disrupt their jutsu. Looks good, but I feel weird about it. The only useful way I can see myself using it is by absorbing someone's chakra until they die. Cruel, but effective since I would gain their chakra in return. This would probably not work against people stronger than me, like the Jinchurikis and the sword, but having tailed beast chakra can help me create other keki Jenkais. Maybe I can even have power-ups like Ginkaku and Kinkaku, though their bloodline helped them. The second ability listed was Emotional Sensing. This ability would allow one to develop the ability to sense the emotions of others through the fluctuations in their chakra. This heightened empathy allows him to understand the feelings of those around him and respond accordingly. No. Just no. This seems like an ability sage mode would give me, so I'd rather wait. That reminds me, I need to start looking for a summon, that would fast track my plans of learning senjutsu. Also, heightening my empathy can have devastating consequences in the future. I am a shinobi who is a tool, a means to an end, more empathy would be counterproductive. The next ability was medical intuition. This ability would give the user an innate understanding of chakra and its effects on the body. It could develop into a keen intuition for diagnosing and treating ailments, enabling him to sense what is wrong with another person's health without the need for medical ninjutsu or medical equipment. They had an ability tailor-made for medical ninjutsu? I am not shocked, but this is pretty unexpected. Yes, I was planning on learning medical ninjutsu, but that was so that I could only tend to myself, not to others. Yes, I am that selfish, deal with it. Having this ability wouldn't help as I already have improved regeneration. I haven't tested its limits, but I am sure when combined with basic medical ninjutsu, it would work well. At least, I hope it will. The next ability was Chakra Soothing. This ability would help one learn how to use their chakra to calm and pacify hostile entities or individuals, including summoned beasts. 
This soothing chakra can diffuse tense situations and establish a sense of tranquility in the user's surroundings. Damn. This is a good one. It seems so trivial, but if someone as creative gets their hands on this, they could either be the savior of the shinobi world or the end who destroys it. It is one of those abilities that authors would give their main characters. It seems like it works just like Koto Amatsukami, but I am not sure whether the target would know if they are being manipulated. If they do, then that would be a massive flaw. That said, Shursue's variant was more, what's the word? Subtle. AO only knew that Danzo was manipulating Mifun because of his Byakugan, but this ability would require one to use their chakra to achieve a similar goal. Even if I get it, I would not be able to use it in front of many Kanoha clans and even some sensory shinobi. The final ability was Chakra Shielding. It would allow one to create a protective barrier of chakra around themselves, shielding against physical and elemental attacks with ease. If I didn't have any chance of getting the Susanoo, then I would probably get it. They say defense is the best offense, or is it the other way around? All in all, I am pretty much pissed that most, if not all, of the abilities here, have major flaws or don't fit my style. Closing the book, Renjiro stood up and returned the book back to its owner who in turn asked, are done going through them? Renjiro nodded his head as he let out a loud sigh. Kushina caught on to the cue, you didn't like any of them? Yes, they were not what I expected. But I guess I was wrong to have higher expectations from the very start. Haha. <laughs> Kushina laughed boisterously. What's funny? Rinjiro, there are no bad abilities or jutsus, only bad users. If you, with your Sharingan, cannot see the diamonds in this rough list, then maybe you are a BA, unfortunate user. Kushina said with a laugh. Says the one who had the list for years, but couldn't get another Chakra Senu, Rinjiro retorted with a chuckle. Anyway, I am interested in your adamant and chains, what about it? How do you manifest them? Renjiro asked. He clearly wanted a demonstration. I vaguely remember her using them during the Magatama process and even saw them binding Karama. I just want to see how she manifests them and judge whether they can be used in combat. It's easy, Kushina said as she took a breath and focused. The chains materialized from her torso with a faint shimmer, their links gleaming like polished metal. Each link looked meticulously crafted. As they extend outward, the chains seem to pulsate with power, vibrating with the raw chakra coursing through them. With a flick of her wrist, Kushina sent the chains whirling through the air, their movements fluid and precise. They spiraled around her in a mesmerizing dance, weaving intricate patterns before lashing out with astonishing speed and precision. She has good control over them. I am now sure even without being a Jinchuriki, Kushina would be a Kage-level shinobi if she lived longer. Renjiro could not help but gawk at the sight as they moved, the chains emitted a faint humming sound, resonating with the force of Kushina's chakra. After the display, Kushina, with a final flourish, retracted the chains back into her body, their shimmering forms dissipating into wisps of energy. Satisfied? Kushina asked. Can you only manifest them from your torso? No, I haven't mastered it yet. I have only focused on its fuinjutsu aspect of making barriers and stuff, but if I do, I would be able to manifest them from anywhere in the body. She hasn't mastered it, yet she was able to bind the Karama with it? What will happen if this ability is mastered to its full potential? She'll basically be Kimamaro on steroids. Wait, how do you know that? Do you think I was the first person in the clan to awaken this ability? Kushina asked. It was pretty obvious she wasn't considering they shared ways of awakening other Sanus. Kushina saw the look on Renjiro's face and said, I did awaken it naturally, but I did prepare my body for it. Can you teach me how to awaken it? Renjiro, I have already said this before, if you decide to take the risk then I will teach you. Thank you, Sensei, Renjiro said. This was so good that he decided to indulge Kushina in her charades. As Renjiro got up and prepared to leave, a thought flashed in his mind. He knew he had to go and prepare for his other duties, but the question was so one that he had thought ever since Kushina enlightened him about Chakra Senu. Before I leave, I still have one more question, he began, you have talked of Chakra Senu like it was some sort of Kamingafage ceremony, so, how was the Uzumaki clan defeated when they had shinobi with such abilities? Before I leave, I still have one more question, 
he began, you have talked of Chakra Senu like it was some sort of coming off age ceremony, so, how was the Uzumaki clan defeated when they had Shinobi with such abilities? Ugh. Kushina sighed once she heard that question. Renjiro was not the first person to ask Kushina that question ever since she moved to Konoha because Minato did too. Renjiro, I am not sure if you have a lot of memories regarding Yuzushiogakure, but if you do, then you would know that while we were a shinobi village we focused more on Fuinjutsu as opposed to raising shinobi forces. I already know how Fuinjutsu can be very powerful when used correctly, so I am sure that the village would have put up a strong fight, Renjiro said. Yes, we had our Fuinjutsu, which was, and still is powerful, but the major reason was that the four major shinobi villages that is, Kirigakure, Iwagakure, Kumogakure and Sunagakure had united against the village. They acted together and spread Konoha thin in its borders so that it couldn't provide Yuzushio with reinforcements. They used a majority of their S-rank shinobi and even some of their Jinchurikis. So they went all in? Renjiro thought. Was there any reason why they all united against Yuzushiogakure, besides our talent in Fuinjutsu? Renjiro asked. He felt weird using the word our, as if he was a part of the village because he just took over a body belonging to one of the villagers. Yes, but for that I need to take you back to the history of the shinobi world. Ever since the first Kage meeting, the other Kages were always threatened by the Hokage since he was powerful enough to collect all the tailed beasts and seal them up with the help of the Uzumaki. So, in an effort to appease them and gain their trust, Lord first split the eight tailed beasts amongst them? Renjiro asked. Yes, and the first Hokage achieved his goal for peace between the villages. Unfortunately, this was only temporary. Of course, it was. They were given tailed beasts, but that was not enough to satiate them. Renjiro thought. After the death of the first Hokage and the Uchiha clan head, Madara Uchiha, the other villages saw this as an opportunity to gain power and resources from other villages, leading to an all-out war, Kushina remarked. Classic politics. Hashirama was a pacifist. His and Madara's power was not only a deterrent against attacking Kanoha but also a deterrent against major wars between the shinobi villages. Once he died, the vacuum he left destabilized the five villages and they became bolder leading to the first war. Do you know how Lord first died? Renjiro inquired. I am not really sure since the village really guards this information. That sucks, because I wanted to know what could possibly kill one of the strongest shinobi to ever live. I guess I'll ask Hiruzen, or Minato when I become strong enough. As I was saying, during the first shinobi war, the impact of our Fuinjutsu was seen on the battlefield. While Konoha lost their second Hokage, the other villages suffered more devastating losses thanks to Yuzushiogakure's Fuinjutsu. After the war, the other villages suffered more with their economic strengths declining since they had fewer shinobi who would sign up for missions and so on. Konoha was doing fairly better which angered the other villages. They then acted against Yuzushio, as a way to weaken Konoha in the last shinobi war, Kushina said. So in the end, the strength of Yuzushio had a limit which the other shinobi villages overwhelmed? Renjiro asked. Yes. In a nutshell. Kushina replied. Exactly how Toborama died and even A, the current Rakage, will die in the next shinobi war. I should learn from this. I not only need to become strong, but I also need to become versatile enough to be unkillable. Renjiro resolved. Again, Kushina Sensei, thanks for the information. I will now take my leave and see you later. Renjiro said as he headed back to his home. Kushina's gaze lingered on his back as he flickered away. No one really knew what she was thinking. Well, that was really informative. I got stronger and learned a few things about this world's history that I didn't know. I can't say that I have had a better day since I got here. Rinjiro thought when he arrived home. Besides getting a Chakra Senu and Kushina promising to teach me how to awaken her chains, I think my eyes might have changed. I don't know how to explain this, but while I know I haven't awakened a Mangekyo Sharingan, I am close to awakening it. Sigh. I am sure I only need a nudge to awaken it. What that nudge will be is what I worried about. Anyway, while awakening it would be good, I will have to keep it a secret for a very long time. 
Doing so would be the best option because I am sure that if it becomes known, Daichi or even Fugaku would want my help in the coup in the future or the village might want to use me against the Uchiha. I don't want to be in Itachi's position, so the best thing to do is become strong and try to change things for the Uchiha. Diplomatically of course, Renjiro chuckled. I also need to get the advanced weight. With how my body has improved, I am sure the current ones won't help. I also need to focus on my ninjutsu to the point where I can master all current fire and wind jutsus and even start creating my own jutsus. In the evening, Renjiro went to the base as usual and began his shift patrolling the village. It was still uneventful much to Renjiro's surprise. He was sure the third shinobi war was on the horizon, so why were the other villages not making moves already? Or is this the calm before the storm? He wondered. After his shift patrolling the village, he went to his squad allocated room ready for the usual training that they did. Hey Renjiro! Tobe greeted him when he arrived. Everyone was there apart from Fujioka. Huh? Did you grow taller overnight? Before he could reply to Tobe's greeting, Toda, the former's brother, asked. He is quite perceptive. I noticed I grew taller by a few inches after the Magatama process since some of my pants didn't as they usually did. It was not to the extent that it was obvious to the naked eye, so I'm surprised he noticed it. Then again, he is an Uchiha. You idiot, Renjiro is still in his growth phase. So why are you surprised? Tobe said to his brother. As the pair began bickering, Renjiro exchanged greetings between Hei and Kagami. He had some small talk with the pair as they waited for their squad leader to arrive. At least, I have some entertainment as I wait for Fujioka. Renjiro thought as he watched Tobe and Tota continue to bicker. The pair was around three years older than him but loved to bicker. Settle down. Fujioka said as soon as he arrived. The statement was more directed to the brother than the rest. Clearing his throat, he began, today, we won't have our normal training. Why? Tota asked as he turned to face his squad leader. I was getting to that, Fujioka gave Tota a cold gaze before continuing, we have received an assignment, so prepare yourselves, we will head out in an hour. We have received an assignment, so prepare yourselves. We will head out in an hour. My first case? Finally. I was getting tired of just patrolling the village. But the timing couldn't be worse. I was planning on training my body to get a good feel of the improvements. Oh well, I could always do that later. What are we supposed to do? Kagami asked. There have been some reports of missing people in the village, we will first head out and meet their families and conduct interviews with them to get a clear picture of what is happening. Interviews? I just hope that this will not take too low, nope, I am not even going to think about it. I won't jinx it. So, get ready and meet me at the entrance of the base, Fujioka finished. He then left his squad members to prepare themselves. It must be your lucky day Renjiro, Toda remarked. Why? Renjiro asked. You are just an initiate, but you are already getting your first case. It's like someone specially requested our squad leader to take the mission, Tobe answered. The brothers shared a similar thought. Fujioka, who was not far away from his squad's room, just smirked when he heard Tobe's statements. Why are they acting like it's a big deal? Renjiro was confused. Yeah, most of us got our very first case after we got to the third or fourth ranks. If you perform well, you might even move a rank or two. Hey added. But what's the benefit of moving up the ranks? It just means more work and responsibilities. Besides, in the next year, I will be one of the few shinobi with a Sharingan who aren't in the force. The four shinobi continued with their preparations all except Renjiro. The latter had formed a habit of carrying all his essentials like weapons, seals, and even extra clothes in his modified seals. So, he was always prepared. The squad then made their way towards the base entrance where they found Fujioka already waiting for them. Alright, as I earlier said, we will have to interview the missing civilian's relatives so that we can narrow down where to start our investigations, Fujioka began, there are 15 missing civilians since we are 6, I will go with Renjiro while we each interview 3 families. Are there any questions? The 5 shinobi before him shook their heads. So here are the addresses, Fujioka handed them a bunch of scrolls. Once we are done with the interviews we will reconvene at the base, Fujioka said with finality as Kagami, Hey, 
Toda, and Tobe each flickered to their respective addresses. We have three addresses, which one should we start with? The squad leader turned to his initiate and asked. Renjiro simply studied the scrolls before replying, we should start with this one, followed by this and then that, he said while pointing at the scrolls. Good choice, Fujioka nodded. They flickered off to the first address. Once Fujioka determined Renjiro's body flickering speed, he quickened the pace. Am I in some sort of test? From the very start, I thought I was accompanying him since I was new to the squad, but from his actions, it feels like I am doing some sort of exam. Renjiro thought as they entered the homestead of one of the missing civilians. Renjiro and Fujioka sat across from the worried family of the missing person in their modest home. Madame Tanaka, a middle-aged woman with worry lines etched on her face, clasped her hands tightly in her lap as she recounted the events leading up to her son's disappearance. I just don't understand, Mrs. Tanaka stammered, her voice trembling with emotion. My son, Hiroshi, he's always been such a responsible boy. He left for work at the market like he does every morning, but he never came back. Renjiro exchanged a glance with Fujioka before speaking gently to Mrs. Tanaka. Mrs. Tanaka, can you tell us if Hiroshi had any enemies or if he was involved in any conflicts recently? Before they entered, Fujioka had made it clear to him that he was just going to observe and let Renjiro take the lead. This confirmed Renjiro's suspicions while also bothering him. This is my first mission, so why is he giving me this responsibility? I am not sure how things work here, but I am sure someone must have put him up to it. Madame Tanaka shook her head, tears welling up in her eyes. No, no, Hiroshi is a good boy. He never gets into trouble with anyone. He's just trying to make an honest living for our family. Fujioka leaned forward, his expression serious. Do you know if Hiroshi had any debts or if he owed money to anyone? She hesitated before nodding slowly. Yes, he mentioned something about owing money to a man who lent him some to start his own stall at the market. But Hiroshi said he was close to paying it off. He wouldn't run away because of that. Fujioka paused before saying, Thank you, Mrs. Tanaka. We'll do everything we can to find Hiroshi and bring him home safely. As they left the Tanaka residence, Renjiro turned to Fujioka, Do you think Hiroshi's debt could be connected to his disappearance? Fujioka nodded grimly. It's possible. We'll need to follow up on that lead and see if we can track down whoever Hiroshi owed money to. But first, let's gather more information from the other addresses. From the other two addresses, there were two children missing. Unlike Hiroshi, these children just disappeared in one of the playgrounds in the village. But similar to Hiroshi's case, their parents had a debt that they failed to pay. They probably used some Jinjutsu on them, that would be the only way, they could lead them off the village. But to do so, they must have used one of the village's entrances. The force guards the village, so this will look bad for the Uchiha clan. When Fujioka and Renjiro returned back to the base, they found the rest of the squad already there. You guys are already done? Good, we can begin and save some time, Kagami how did the interviews go? Fujioka asked. The rest began summarizing their findings, with Renjiro informing the squad of their findings, Fujioka calmly listened. So most of them are children? Fujioka asked. Yes, and the two places they disappeared from the playground and market, Renjiro added. So we can start from there, let's gather more information from the market vendors and see if anyone saw anything suspicious on the day he went missing. If we don't find anyone, we can move to the person who lent them the money. Fujioka said. They all did so and none of the vendors noticed anything wrong with the missing civilians before they disappeared. Their next course of action was to head to the place of the moneylender. The squad arrived at the address Madame Tanaka had provided for the loan shark, only to find the building abandoned. Renjiro frowned, his brow furrowing in confusion. This doesn't make sense. Madame Tanaka was certain this was the place. He used his chakra field to ascertain that the building was empty. Kagami scanned the surroundings, it looks like this place has been abandoned for a while. But that doesn't mean our lead is a dead end. There might still be clues inside. They approached the building and pried open the door, the hinges groaning in protest, and stepped into the dim interior. They used their Sharingans to search every corner of the abandoned building. Renjiro squatted down as he noticed something. Hmm? Is this blood? Fujioka-sama, 
I think I found something, Fujioka neared him, Kagami, there is blood here. Kagami sprung into action as he placed what looked like a seal and performed a hand sign. Their environs changed and something like a red essence became visible to Renjiro, who had activated his Sharingan. Was that a seal? Renjiro asked. Wait, Kagami said. The essence rose and started heading north. The squad followed the essence and it led to a shack behind. Once they opened the shack, a nauseating smell met them. What is that smell? Tobe asked. Wait, are those bodies, Hei said as she neared the cause of the smells. Right before them, there were three dead bodies. A man and two children lay there dead with their bodies already decomposing. Fujioka stood before the three bodies with a grim look on his face. The situation has changed. This is no longer a kidnapping incident that I thought, it is potentially a murder case. Fujioka spoke, this changes everything. What we're dealing with now is not about finding the missing civilians, but it's murder. If these three were killed, then the others are in danger if not already dead. He paused to let his squad members understand the situation before continuing, the next thing we should do is try to identify these three from the list we had so that we could inform their families. The squad got into action, with some identifying the bodies while others continued inspecting the shack in case there were any clues the murders might have left. After careful examination, the man appeared to be in his late thirties, with weathered features and calloused hands which was a stark contrast to the innocence of the two children who lay beside him. The children, a boy and a girl looked to be no older than ten years old, their faces frozen in expressions of terror and pain. This is strange, Tobe said. What's wrong? Fugaku asked. The man killed isn't among the fifteen reported missing civilians, Tobe remarked. And the two other bodies? They are among the missing children. That is indeed strange. Did they already get someone before they were reported missing? Renjiro thought. They most likely already killed the man before his family reported him missing, Kagami said. Echoing Renjiro's thoughts. Yes, considering that the man is the only one with wounds around his neck, they probably stabbed him, Fujioka agreed. And the two children seem to have died before the man considering how their bodies have decomposed more than the man's, Toda added. It seems he is competent when he is serious. Every time I have interacted with he's been so carefree. Rinjiro thought surprised by Toda's addition. Guys, as the squad was deep in speculation about the gruesome scene they had just discovered came to be, Hay's call broke through their conversation. With a sense of urgency, they hurried over to where Hay stood, waiting for them with a grave expression on her face. What did you find, Hey? Fujioka asked Hay gestured towards one of the walls, where there were several seals etched into it in dark red. I found these seals inside the shack, she explained. Yes, before you ask, that is blood they used. Probably belonging to the man who was killed, Hei said. The seals themselves were unlike any Renjiro had seen before, their designs foreign and mysterious. Some resembled traditional Uzumaki symbols, while others seemed to be more abstract in nature, with their meanings unknown. Fujioka turned to Kagami, Kagami, can you decode these seals? We need to know what they're for. This was the first time Renjiro realized that Kagami was also a Fuinjutsu expert. They had only trained together as a team for a week, but the training was more focused on the strategic and physical aspects of the squad. Kagami approached the seals and began to study them intently. With a practiced eye, he traced the intricate patterns with his fingers, his mind working quickly to decipher their meaning. These seals are unlike anything I've seen before, Kagami remarked, they're different from the ones normally used in Konoha. Whoever created them must have had a deep understanding of Fuinjutsu than the normal one. Fujioka's brow furrowed with concern as he considered Kagami's words. If these seals were indeed of a foreign origin, it could mean that their adversary was more skilled and dangerous than they had initially thought. Fortunately for him, one of his squad members decided to shed more light on the seals. Although the language used is foreign, some symbols used are familiar, Renjiro said as everyone's attention shifted to him. Do you know about Uzumaki Fuinjutsu? Kagami asked in surprise. He had come across some of their materials, but they were too complex for him to understand. Yes, I have learned it, well some of it, Renjiro responded. Why did you not say that you knew Fuinjutsu at all? Kagami asked. Renjiro gave him a plain look and replied, you just never asked. 
Sensing the mood changing, Fujioka tried to shift the focus back to the matter at hand, you said that there are some symbols that you recognize, can you tell us what they mean? Well, first of all, advanced Uzumaki Fuenjutsu techniques are mostly used by the user's blood, so most probably the blood might not belong to the dead man, Renjiro began. Secondly, in this matrix, there are a few symbols that I recognize from Uzumaki Fuenjutsu. They are these three, Renjiro said pointing to the three symbols that were vertices of the matrix formula. Translated, they mean Lord, Time and Born. Although with the current situation, the last one might be reborn. Renjiro stated. So most likely, this was a ritual? Fujioka asked visibly furious at the thought of it. Yes, and the time symbol might have been used to speed up the decomposition of the bodies. Sigh. Alright, we should probably store the bodies before we send them into the intelligence core. There might be a chance that their memories can be read, Fujioka instructed. The squad followed the directive and Kagami brought out seals to store the three bodies. They also excavated the wall with the seals and stored it. They would need other Fuenjutsu experts in the villages to try and decode the seals. After finishing up, they set up a barrier around the shack since they might need to revisit the scene for further investigations. Once the squad reached the base, all of them apart from Kagami were released as Fujioka and the former had to pass the bodies and seals to their superiors so that they could shed more light on the investigation. This whole thing has been weird. Was the cult that committed the murders the one belonging to Jashin? Haydn is the only one from the original plot that I remember being involved with a cult. If it is them, then is someone trying to gain the same immortality that Haydn had? Thank God, I already know of a way to counter them if they do succeed. Still trying, and succeeding, in this shows that the cult or whichever organization it is that they are really bold. And dangerous. They did this in one of the major shinobi villages. As Renjiro went on to focus on his ninjutsu, elsewhere in the village, a meeting was being held in the Hokage's office. Once, Fujioka notified his superior about the results of his squad's investigation. The report quickly ascended the ranks and was eventually brought to Uchiha Daichi's attention. He then notified the Hokage who called for Danzo, Koharu and Hamira. Besides being the Konoha Council, the three also acted in the capacity of the third Hokage's advisors. Daichi stood in the office waiting for the arrival of the three with his demeanor composed, but his eyes betraying a hint of unease. As the leader of the village's law enforcement, Daichi braced himself for what he knew would be a grilling from the three council members. Once the three council members arrived and were brought up to speed, Danzo wasted no time in addressing Daichi. Daichi, it is clear that your police force has failed in its duty to protect the people of Konoha. These recent incidents just show your incompetence. Daichi's jaw tightened, but he kept his composure as he responded. My officers are doing everything in their power to investigate these crimes. We are facing a highly skilled and elusive opponent, but we are making progress. Koharu's voice dripped with disdain as she spoke, progress? If that's what you call it, then it's not nearly enough. Innocent lives are at stake, and your failures are putting the entire village in danger. Hamura nodded in agreement, his expression grave. We cannot afford to have a police force that is incapable of handling such threats. Daichi refused to back down. I assure you, we are doing everything we can to find the culprits. Hiruzen interjected with a measured tone. Let us not forget that our priority should be to work together to solve this crisis, rather than pointing fingers and assigning blame. Daichi, I trust that you didn't just come here to report this problem, but you also came here with a solution. Daichi nodded, yes, I do have a solution. I only came here to ask for an approval. On what exactly? Koharu asked. I wanted to send the squad in charge of this to find the culprits, Daichi remarked. As Daichi returned to his office in the evening, he found Fugaku diligently working on some paperwork at his desk. Fugaku looked up as his father entered, how did the meeting go, father? Fugaku inquired, Daichi's face immediately darkened as he recalled the events that occurred in the Hokage's office. I wanted to send the squad in charge of this to find the culprits, Daichi remarked. And do you have sufficient information on this group to make such a demand? Hiruzen asked. Although the Uchiha clan had the lowest quota for taking missions in Konoha, the chief of the police, who was also the clan head, had the power to send squads on specific missions out of the villages. 
The missions had to be related to matters of the police force, such as this incident where they wanted to raid a base suspected of belonging to a cult group. Once the mission was planned, the chief of police had to seek the Hokage's approval on it, otherwise, the shinobi taking up the mission may be labeled rogue shinobi. Daichi nodded solemnly. Yes, Lord Third. Through the intelligence corps, we have received information that the group responsible for these heinous crimes has a base near the border we share with the land of grass. While we are not sure that, the seals used have been used in one of their operations. Koharu Yudetain up, and what makes you think that sending a squad against them will be any more effective than our previous efforts? Daichi met Koharu's gaze and said, one of the members of the squad has experience with Uzumaki Fuenjutsu. They were also the squad that solved the case, so I would like to give them the opportunity to finish things through. When the three council members heard that someone knew Uzumaki Fuenjutsu, they were surprised. It had been barely a decade since they lost Yuzushiogakyur to enemy forces, leading to the access to seals, since no one to replicate their kind of work. Since they had been depending on them for a while, fewer people had managed to learn their Fuenjutsu because of its complexity. Who is this person who has learned Uzumaki Fuenjutsu? Hamura couldn't help but ask. It is Uzumaki Renjiro, Daichi replied. Danzo's eyes widened. Last time I checked, Kushina was teaching him Fuenjutsu. It has been less than two years, and he has already learned his clan's Fuenjutsu. I was right, he might be a great asset to the root. Daichi loved the surprised look on the elder's faces. While he was aware that Renjiro had not mastered that type of Fuenjutsu, he wanted to further his case, so he decided to play that card. Hiruzen was also amused because he was aware of Renjiro's progress from his talks with Kushina as well as his occasional spying of the village. While Danzo was still thinking of ways to force Hiruzen to let him use Renjiro, his brows furrowed as he asked, are you suggesting that the success of this investigation hinges solely on the abilities of a mere Chunin? Daichi nearly scoffed but stood his ground, not solely, but I believe his experience would be of great help. We also believed that the police force would keep our civilians safe, but that was not the case, Danzo began, the Root and Umbu also have experienced shinobi who are familiar with the Uzumaki Fuenjutsu, so I think that sending the Root will be the best option here, Haruzan's eyes twitched when he heard Danzo's suggestion. As usual, he is trying to use this situation to gain more benefits. I need to be neutral in this situation. After carefully weighing the pros and cons of each option, which were the Kanoha police force, the Root or the Umbu, Hiruzen finally made a decision. While I have heard all of your opinions, I think that sending the Umbu would be the ideal decision. Hiruzen mused, since the base is close to our borders, we need to be careful in how we handle this so that in case matters spill over to the land of grass, we can room to deny our involvement. Danzo inwardly sneered. While Hamura, Koharu and he were council members, Hiruzen only needed to listen to their opinions since he had the final say in the matters. The others nodded in agreement, while Daichi kept his word to himself. While he was bothered with the fact that the Umbu and the Root had been slowly chipping away their jurisdiction he consoled himself that Danzo did not get what he wanted in this situation. Fugaku's expression darkened as he processed the result of the meeting. That's unacceptable, he declared, they called us incompetent, but they won't allow us to remedy the situation. Calm down Fugaku, Daichi said, this was just politics at its best. All three forces wanted to gain information this group held and the Hokage was aware of this. We just lost this time. But father, why do you always allow them to get in the way of our work? Fugaku asked. Fugaku, I am first the clan head then the chief of police, Daichi began, I always need to know when to compromise and when to stand my ground. The fate of the clans rests on my shoulders, so every action I take good or bad, even as the chief of police, will reflect back to the clan. All right father, I will keep trusting your decisions, Fugaku reluctantly nodded. Now, go get me Fujioka. There are some matters I need to talk to him, Daichi instructed. Daichi watched Fugaku leave to do what he instructed, and he couldn't help but think, he is still young and hot-headed, but it is clear the village is trying to ostracize us. I just hope that when he takes my position as the clan head, the Uchiha clan won't act against the village. So the Hokage declared that the Umbu will finish up the case, Daichi declared. Understood, clan head, Fujioka said. 
Daichi had informed him of Haruzen's decision on the whole matter so that they would be able to continue with their training and preparations for other tasks. Seeing that there was nothing else to discuss, Fujioka prepared to leave when Daichi said, Fujioka before you leave, there is something I wanted to ask, Fujioka stood and gestured for Daichi to continue. So far, what do you think of Renjiro? Fujioka took some time to think before saying, while it is clear the boy has his reservations, considering that none of us knew he was into Fuinjutsu, he has a clear head on him. He is a more capable shinobi when you take into account his age. While I have not determined the extent of his capabilities, his composure during training and our recent case just solidifies this. Daichi nodded, so you are fine with his staying in your squad? Yes, with more refining, I am sure he will be a strong shinobi. That is good to hear, Fujioka. You can now leave. Daichi instructed. Fujioka left with Daichi deciding to act on an idea that crossed his mind. While the conversation was going on, the subject of their talk was in one of the clan meditation rooms meditating, or at least he tried to. Since it was deep into the night, Renjiro had already done some ninjutsu training and was finishing his day with some meditation. Unfortunately for him, he couldn't clear his mind. I don't know why, but my gut feelings keep telling me that there was more to the murders than we thought. Anyway, I will talk to Fujioka about this tomorrow. Besides, I already memorized the seals used. So I can begin studying them now. If I am lost, I can always ask Kushina. Under the Shroud of Darkness, five figures moved silently through the dense foliage of the forest. They were clad in matching grey cloaks and from the way that they were flickering, it was clear that they were shinobi. Each figure wore an animal mask with the first figure having a cat mask on. Beside them was another figure donned a wolf mask, while the three figures following closely behind them wore tortoise, leopard and a fox masks. The group of shinobi moved to the forest and eventually emerged into a vast expanse of grassland stretching out before them. After a couple of meters, the group stopped. At the forefront of the group, the shinobi wearing the wolf mask turned to their side and signaled to the figure adorning the leopard mask. With a nod, the fox shinobi stepped forward and made a set of hand signs. As the final hand sign was formed, a ripple passed through the air distorting the view before them. The grassland transformed into a rugged valley dotted with numerous caves. There were torched lights scattered all over, clearly this was the base of an organization. The valley stretched out below them, and they were lucky that they were close to the edge of a sheer cliff granting them a commanding view of their surroundings. With the Jinjutsu broken, Leopard made a hand sign as he erected a barrier around the valley as Wolf asked, Cat, how many people are there? Cat activated his chakra field and after a few seconds, answered, There are around 150 people in the base, Wolf nodded, How many Jounins? 8, Cat replied, Wolf absorbing the information as she contemplated their next course of action. With the number of their enemies now known, the group would need to adjust their strategy accordingly, ensuring that their approach was well thought through. You all know what to do, Wolf said to her four companions who dispersed in different directions, disappearing into the shadows of the night. Wolf remained behind and focused her chakra. Slowly claws began to emerge from her hands, extending outwards. With her preparations complete, flickered to the darkness of the night. The masked group only had one objective, and that was to eliminate every person in the base. What followed could only be described as a massacre. Wolf descended upon the unsuspecting guards stationed at the perimeter of the base. Her movements were swift and calculated, her claws slicing through the air with lethal efficiency. The guards, caught off guard, had little time to react as Wolf unleashed her fury upon them. One by one, they fell before her with their cries of alarm muffled by their predator. As the last of the guards fell silent, she did not stop and walked into the base to continue her slaughter. A similar, though less bloody, scene was happening in other parts of the valley as each member of the group executed their assigned tasks with ruthless efficiency. Tortoise, who was a Yamanaka, infiltrated a room where several unsuspecting victims lay asleep. With a swift hand sign, he used a jutsu that targeted their nervous systems, snuffing out their lives without a sound. The victims had a better end to their lives than some of their counterparts as they died in their sleep. Fox, a member of the Nara clan, used one of his clan's techniques that extended his shadow and bound his victims eventually strangling them to death. With how quick and efficient the process was he moved on from cave to cave just like Tortoise. 
The remaining members of the team carried out their own missions with equal determination. While they were not from any renowned clans in Kanoa, that did not stop them from matching their colleagues' body count. After close to three hours, the only living souls were the masked figures. With the base now under their control, the masked figures ransacked the entire base, looting anything they deemed useful. They gathered supplies, weapons, and information, leaving no stone unturned. As they were ransacking the rooms, they entered rooms where their senses were assaulted by the overwhelming stench of death. Rows upon rows of lifeless bodies lay before them, arranged in an order similar to what Renjiro's squad had discovered the day before. Wolf said with a somber tone. We need to gather the bodies and store them, she instructed, we'll sort them back at the village. The masked figures set to work and stored the lifeless bodies with care. There were countless bodies, twice as many as the people who were alive in the base a couple of hours ago. Fox was the first among them who finished first, giving him time to think. Something doesn't feel right, he muttered. Tortoise noticed him deep in thought. He couldn't see it through the mask, but since he had known Fox since his early years, he knew him like the back of his hand. As Tortoise approached, Fox felt a voice in his head, what is wrong Shikaku? Inoichi, he responded silently, they were on a mission so this was the best way they could communicate without exposing their identities, something about this feels wrong. Tortoise, who was Inoichi Yamanaka, furrowed his brows in contemplation and asked, why do you say that? Fox, who was Shikaku Nara, hesitated for a moment, grappling with the swirling doubts that clouded his mind. The cult's power, he explained, it doesn't match what expected. They should have put up more of a fight. They also killed people in Kanoha, so they must have already prepared for our retaliation, but it seems we caught them off guard. While Shikaku might have sounded arrogant, Inoichi knew better than to see it that way. He said, perhaps this was just a branch of a larger organization, the documents we got could lead us to their main base. Before Shikaku could respond, Wolf appeared beside them and said, it seems our work here is done, she declared, let's burn this place to the ground before we return to the village. Back in the village, Fujioka had just informed his squad about the result of their investigations. Fujioka-sama, I have been thinking about the case for a while, and I think we might have made wrong conclusions, Renjiro said. Wrong conclusions? Fujioka thought as he squinted his eyes. What makes you think so Renjiro? Maybe I am overthinking, but here goes. Renjiro thought. I feel like this case might have been just a distraction, Renjiro began, we concluded that a cult might have done this, which is where we made our first mistake. Renjiro looked at his squad members and when he saw that they were intently listening, he continued, a cult, especially one that deals with human sacrifices, would want to remain under the radar. Murdering civilians in a village like Kanoha seems out of character. So you are saying that the cult group was framed? Kagami asked. Renjiro nodded, yes, but I don't know by who. The Umbu is already handling this case, so whether your doubts are true or not, it won't really change the situation, Fujioka said. If the group was indeed framed, then it means that the remaining missing civilians are alive, Hei added, yes, if they do not get any bodies of the missing civilians, then the murders we discovered were just distractions. True to Renjiro's words, once the Umbu squad returned to the village, none of the initial missing civilians were among the bodies retrieved. But missing 13 in over 300 was not enough to force Kanoha to make a move. It was not even enough for the idea to be brought before the third Hokage, so the only Kanoha council member who knew about was Daichi for obvious reasons. But that was only the case until a certain fact was unearthed concerning the missing civilians. Have you found anything yet? Fugaku asked Kobayashi. Aoi Kobayashi was a member of Kanoha's intelligence corps. He had been tasked with figuring out what the missing civilians shared. Since it was not an official mandate, Daichi had to call in a few favors from the intelligence corps for this work. Yes, I think. I found something, Kobayashi stuttered as he collected himself. What is it? Fugaku asked. All of them had loose relations with various clans in the village, Kobayashi stated. Kobayashi went on to explain that each of the missing civilians was somehow related to a major clan in the village. The majority of them had parents who were born to civilians and shinobi from clans in the village. Most of them either died during the shinobi wars or never decided to pursue a shinobi career. 
It was one of those situations where one had to draw lines in the sand to ascertain their family tree. At first, many did not think much of this, but when Daichi revealed to Fugaku that those kids still had chances, though slim, of gaining abilities from their bloodlines, the situation changed. While such people were not considered worthy investments by their clans, there was a place that thirsted for Kekiai Genkais, especially those belonging to clans. That place was Kumogakure. While it was a strong shinobi village on its own, it still lacked the number of Kekiai Genkai users, particularly clans, when compared to the other four villages. The other reason that supported this claim was that the base of the cult group that was framed was located on the west of the Land of Fire while the Land of Lightning was on its east. So Kumo had planned on sending Kanoha on the opposite side. Once Daichi joined the dots, he didn't even need to convince Hiruzen to approve a mission as the latter quickly agreed. This time, the squad taking up the mission was led by Fugaku and Renjiro was allowed to join the squad since he was the one who pointed out the situation to them. Kidnapping children? Well, I know they are used to it considering that they already tried kidnapping Kushina and would even try to kidnap the Hyuga princess in the future. But still, they are already a strong village with the likes of their two Jinchurikis and ridiculous rakage. Renjiro thought as the squad assembled. They already have a head start on us, so we will have to move quickly, Daichi instructed the squad as they prepared to leave. Fortunately, they were also transporting civilians, so that must have slowed them down, he said as the squad departed the village. It was not hard figuring out the route Kumo shinobis used because after they narrowed down their searches, Konoha's spy network provided information about it. The squad only had to track them down. It was only after a week when they reached the borders of Shimagakure, deep within the land of snow, that the squad finally caught sight of his targets. The shinobis in question were well over the moon as they had accomplished their mission and were close to home as the land of snow was one of the two nations between the land of fire and the land of lightning. The other nation was the land of hot water. I am sure Lord Rakage will be proud of what we have done. With these people, the village might have a better chance to awaken Kekiai Genkais than we currently have, Kaori Hata thought. She was an elite Jounin Kunoichi who was tasked with an important mission that would help the village in the future. It was already at night, so they were setting up camp after using a few earth jutsus, to set up a temporary base. Everything was going on well until one of her subordinates ran to her informing her that they were under attack. It can't be Kanoha, they should be dealing with that cult group. Even if they discovered our plan, they won't have enough time to catch up to us. Kaori consoled herself as she went to see who was attacking them. As soon as she saw the enemy team attacking them, her heart fell as a chill ran down her spine. It was not because of the number of shinobi they were facing, it was because of who they were facing. No. It can't be. She muttered. She recognized the young brown-haired shinobi blasting fire jutsus at them. It was Fugaku, someone who she had fought against in the previous war. Don't look at their eyes, it's Fugaku of the wicked eyes. Kaori shouted to her subordinates. Hopefully, they haven't fallen for his jinjutsu, otherwise, we should just surrender our lives. She thought. While Kaori was thinking of ways to counter Fugaku, Renjiro was experiencing a different sight. Were we even needed for this mission? Fugaku is strong enough to handle this on his own. He barely even broke a sweat. He thought. Once the Kanoha squad caught the whim of Kumo Shinobi, they hastened their pace and eventually caught. With one look from Fugaku, all five Kumo Shinobi were trapped in his Jinjutsu. The Kumo Shinobis did not even know that they were already trapped in a Jinjutsu, but this was exactly what Fugaku wanted. He took this opportunity to get more information from them as he asked some questions. What were you doing in Kanoha? Fugaku asked. We were on a mission to get civilians from Kanoha, Kaori answered. I can't even sense that she is under someone's control. Fugaku could basically use her to cause a lot of damage in Kumogakure if he wanted to. If he is this powerful now, then how strong was he after he got his MS? The coup that the Uchiha were planning would have been more one-sided than I thought. That's if we remove Shursue from the equation. Renjiro thought. What were you going to do with them? Fugaku continued with his questioning. We were going to force them to breed to see if we could awaken one of the Kekiai Genkais from Kanoha. Why did you do this? 
To get more chances of gaining a Kekiai Genkai, at this point, Kaori and the other Kumo Shinobi skirted over the fact that they wanted more Kekiai Genkai which showed that they wouldn't get more information from them. What are we going to do with them? Rinjiro asked seeing that Fugaku was done with his questioning. Of course, we are going to kill them. They are of no use to us because we can get more intel from their memories. Can't the Hokage use them to negotiate with Kumo? Renjiro inquired. They are just average Jounins with one of them barely being an elite Jounin. The Rakage would not stoop to that level. Fugaku replied with a smirk. Renjiro was intently focused as he continued to work on the seal spread out before him. Each symbol he inscribed, showed how experienced in Fuinjutsu he had become in the last three months it was too quiet for where he was, but the environment afforded him peace that helped him concentrate more on the seal he was working on. But his solitude was interrupted when the door opened and two figures walked in. The two new entrants were Achiha Suzun and Achiha Kegi. They were members of the police force just like him and arrived to begin their shift for the night. As they entered, Renjiro glanced up from his task, a bit surprised. Is it already time, he thought as he spared a quick glance towards the window, confirming that dusk had already passed. It seems I was too busy with the seals to focus on the time. Renjiro thought as he greeted his colleagues. Good evening, Suzun, Keigi, U Renjiro, is Yuki not here? Keigi inquired. Yuki, Renjiro's partner during this shift in manning the prison, was noticeably absent. Renjiro replied, Yuki left earlier. Our shift ended, but since you two were running late, I decided to stay behind and wait for you. Suzun blushed while Keigi had a sheepish look on his face when Renjiro pointed out their lack of punctuality. If that's the case, then it's fine, Suzun said as she walked towards the corridors of the building they were in. It's about time. Renjiro thought as he understood what she was going to do. When I was first told that I would be manning the prison, I thought that it would be too tiresome. After I realized that the police force used Jinjutsus and seals to keep the prisoners in check, it became my dream job in the force. The police force used chakra suppression seals on every prisoner to suppress their chakras as well as Jinjutsu to keep them in control. This only worked on petty criminals, the stronger ones were kept at another facility under the route. With most of the prisoners having their chakras suppressed, it became light work for any officer manning the prison to have them under their control. Just like a future Kazakage, the prisoners remained in a near-continuous state of Jinjutsu. As Suzun completed her rounds of using the Jinjutsu on the prisoners, Renjiro knew it was time for him to take his leave. With a final nod, he bid her and Kagi farewell and made his way out of the prison. Walking through the quiet streets of Kanoha, Renjiro reflected on his journey since he joined the police force. It had been three months since he took his first case, and after that life happened on full throttle. He was no longer an initiate since his superiors recognized his contributions and promoted him to the second rank. His theories on his first case left a lasting impression that his later efforts were greatly appreciated. Contrary to expectations, climbing the rank came with more responsibilities than benefits. Renjiro was right the reward of good work was more work. It was like the force was saying that you are now more capable than before, so here's more work. Renjiro was assigned to the prison to man them. Fortunately for him, the schedule was more flexible for him as he was allowed to discuss with his colleagues when he would manage them. This was a contrast to the village patrols that he would not be given time to alter his working hours. With the normal operations of the prison, Renjiro decided to focus on his Fuinjutsu during that time to hit two birds with one stone. These gave him time to improve his skills to the extent that Renjiro was now working on advanced seals such as the Five Element Seal. He also used the time to create extra storage seals and explosive tags that he continued to sell to get more time to study Fuinjutsu as it was not cheap at all. Moreover, his Fuinjutsu was not the only thing that changed as his squad in the police force also did. Just like him, Kagami was promoted and became a squad leader. With Kagami's promotion to squad leader, he had taken Uchiha Hei with him for obvious reason, to start building his squad. His promotion was more of a ripple effect caused by the retirement of one of the police force commanders. This event set off a chain reaction of promotions and reassignments from the top personnel to those who were bottom of the chain like Kagami. Regardless, Renjiro couldn't deny that Kagami's promotion to squad leader was well deserved. Having served alongside him in their squad, 
he had witnessed firsthand Kagami's natural leadership qualities and his ability to inspire those around him. However, Kagami's departure had left their squad with only three members, aside from Fujioka. While Fujioka assured them that they would be assigned a new member in the coming months, it was clear that they would have to adapt to working as a smaller team in the meantime. The other important thing that happened was Renjiro's confirmation of his chakra purification ability he got through the Magatama ceremony. On their way back from chasing the Kumo Shinobi, Renjiro had asked Fugaku to try and use his Jinjutsu on him. After numerous failed attempts from him, the Chakra Senu ability was confirmed. If even Fugaku, renowned for his prowess in Jinjutsu, couldn't affect him, then who could? Yet, as Renjiro observed Fugaku's reaction to his resistance, a pang of regret crept over him. While the confirmation of his chakra purification ability was undoubtedly good, he couldn't help but feel like he made a mistake. Fugaku was even more alarmed by that even after Renjiro explained how he got it. I should have just used a different way to confirm that. Now that Fugaku knows, it is inevitable that Daichi will also know this. If more people know about it, it will lose its effectiveness as a hidden ace. That whole interaction opened Renjiro's eyes. While the Uchiha clan was hospitable to him, the incident made him realize how to manage the target he had painted on himself as he would always remain an outsider to the clan and even to the village. On a positive note, this drove Renjiro to focus more on his training. He had stopped meditating with the fire and wind chakra crystals as it now yielded meager results. Only earth, water and lightning produced visible results which he meditated with occasionally. Renjiro also got new training weights that were an upgrade from his previous ones. He bought the one where he had to use a seal on him. It had the ability to accommodate greater weights and target specific areas of the body. This helped him push his physical limits further than ever before. His ninjutsu did not lag behind. Despite the limited availability of wind jutsus in Kanoha, Renjiro had managed to fully master each one within his reach. While Renjiro had not completely mastered the wind nature, he was close as he was now thinking of creating his own wind jutsus. In contrast, the vast array of fire jutsus available in Kanoha made him slow down his progress in fire style. Despite his Sharingan granting him the ability to memorize techniques with ease, mastering each fire jutsu was a whole other issue. His only frustration was his stagnating taijutsu skills. Despite his determination, he found himself unable to progress further. In his quest for improvement, Renjiro had sought out sparring partners among his fellow initiates back when he was one hoping to glean new insights and techniques to enhance his taijutsu style. However, T these sessions had yielded little progress. He also had to learn how to adapt his style due to the physical changes wrought by the Magatama process and his natural growth. He was no longer satisfied by evasive maneuvers, as switching to a more close combat style would allow him to leverage his newfound strength and regeneration capabilities to their fullest potential. But that was for later, now Renjiro decided to continue to work on his next seal as soon as he reached his home. Immediately after the Magatama process, Renjiro had asked Kushina to help him learn how to awaken the adamant in chains because it was such a versatile ability. Kushina obliged, but she decided to take her time with her guidance. Renjiro did not know, but she was doing it for his good. Fortunately, that was until recently. Kushina surprised Renjiro by telling him that although she was the first person to awaken the ability naturally, after the process, the first user of the ability had awoken it later in their life after completing a series of steps. Although you have to complete these two steps, it is not guaranteed that you will awaken the ability considering that you already have the chakra purification ability, Kushina said. Seems fair enough, otherwise, we would have been informed if there was any other Uzumaki with such an ability. They would even have been in line to become the next Jinchuriki after Mito. Renjiro nodded. The only thing you need to do is master barrier ninjutsu first, then master yin and yang release as well as ensure that your chakra control is exceptional. Good thing you already have that covered, Kushina stated. Why do I need to learn barrier ninjutsu? Rinjiro, the chains that I possess are fundamentally barrier and fuinjutsu related. The fact that it is mainly used for binding targets, makes it a tool that leans more to barrier ninjutsu and sealing. Either way, learning barrier ninjutsu would come in handy. Especially in the event I go against a tailed beast. Their beast bombs already look devasting when I watch them. 
I am sure they will be more deadly when I get a first-hand look. Must I learn all barrier ninjutsu? Or just specific ones? Renjiro asked. You just need to learn a few to create a solid foundation in the field. But as always, the more you learn then the better your chances are at awakening the ability, Kushina clarified. So, between Barrier Ninjutsu and Inyang release, which one should I first focus on? Barrier Ninjutsu, Kushina began, just follow the order I gave you. Knowing about the barriers will help you feel the capabilities of the Chakra Senu, while Inyang release will do the same for your Chakra. Learning about that type of release will also help you reinforce your jutsus as various ninjutsu require different quantities of yin and yang chakra. Renjiro's forehead creased as he asked, but if that's the case, then wouldn't it be better to learn the release first, before learning the barrier ninjutsu? It doesn't work that way. Mastering the yin yang release takes time. You need to unlearn certain habits that you have subconsciously formed when learning ninjutsu and that required patience, which I am sure you don't have. Renjiro's eye twitched. What do you mean? I am the most patient person you know. He rebutted. Kushina gave him a deadpan look as she said, immediately after you woke up from the Magatama, you started pestering me about getting another Chakra Senu. Your body hadn't even had time to rest. Anyway, where was I? Yes. Relearning all your Jutsus at once will be quicker than doing so, then learning the barrier ones next. Alright, which barrier ninjutsu should I start with? Renjiro relented. The ones you need to focus on first are barrier method formation, barrier formation, triple formula, canopy method formation, recluse technique, confinement barrier, and five element barrier. This, of course, is in the order of easiest to hardest. After mastering them, what next? Kushina leaned back on her chain and said, then it becomes a waiting game. Ah? I forgot. She already said that it was not guaranteed. I am basically playing a game of chance, but her guidance is helping me will the chances to my favor. Renjiro thought. That was what Renjiro had been focusing on during the last three months when it came to Fuinjutsu. Although Kushina had highlighted a clear path for him when it came to barrier ninjutsu, Renjiro decided to start with the hardest one first. No, Renjiro wasn't being arrogant or conceited, that was just part of his nature. He was never methodical and he believed that trying, and failing, at harder tasks would give a better understanding of the current situation. However, that school of thought couldn't apply everywhere with this instance being one of them. Renjiro just swallowed his pride and began from the first one. Barrier method formation was the basic of the basic when it came to barrier ninjutsu. It was a trap ninjutsu where an area was defined using a number of special tags. When the area was entered by an opponent, a barrier would be created. This seems interesting, good the barrier's properties vary depending on the tags used. So even if it's basic, if I add a pinch of creativity then it can be useful. Renjiro surmised. Although it was a basic barrier ninjutsu, it was still a very high class ninjutsu. This was because to prevent the trap from being noticed, the individual tags were usually placed in hidden locations, such as the shade of trees. In the event that the tags become exposed, disarming them would be hard. With Renjiro's history in Fuinjutsu, this was a fairly easy ninjutsu to learn. He even began experimenting on different seal properties such as using explosive tags so that whoever enters the area, gets hit by the attack. The next one was Barrier Formation, Triple Formula. It was pretty similar to the first one as it only increased the number of sealing formulas used to three. This helped increase the distance of the barrier and also its potency when you decide to use explosive tags. The third one, canopy formation was redundant. It worked the same as Renjiro's chakra field. This ninjutsu would allow the user to create a spherical detection barrier with the user at the center. At the user's command, the detection barrier could expand, grasping everything in the surroundings. The users could also detect anything that moves inside the barrier space with their own sense. The barrier would also move with the user. It was a barrier suitable for protecting assets like villages since the user could be more than one and its control could be decentralized. While it seems good, it is not as subtle as chakra fields when inspecting people. The recluse ninjutsu would enable Renjiro to open a path in an existing barrier while the confinement ninjutsu was the same as the first one besides using hand signs instead of tags. The last one was what Renjiro was still working on. 
The five seal barrier allowed one to erect a barrier on seals placed in four directions congregating to the one centrally placed. Ha! Huh. While it is good to know that the barrier will still remain as long as one of the seals is in position, it sure is chakra intensive, Renjiro said as he took time to catch his breath. Practicing the barrier made his reserves, which Renjiro was always proud of take a hit. This didn't mean that using the barrier was going to need ungodly amounts of chakra, Renjiro had just been reckless by continuously erecting the barrier so that he could master it. I just hoped that this would be worth it, he muttered. As Renjiro continued with his barrier ninjutsu practice, a few thousand kilometers from him, a meeting was held in a dark room. As the meeting was going on, a figure flickered into the room and immediately knelt on one knee to the person chairing the meeting. Seeing this, the chair of the meeting was prompted to ask, has it been confirmed? Has it been confirmed? The chair of the meeting, who was a tall, tan man with a large muscular frame, leaned forward and asked. He had shoulder-length blonde hair as well as a large beard that was well-maintained. The kneeling shinobi, clad in dark attire and a mask concealing their identity, replied with a respectful tone, yes, Lord Third. Our scouts have verified their presence somewhere in the Land of Frost. Our spies in the Land of Fire have also confirmed this. A. The third rakage and chair of the meeting that was interrupted by the shinobi leaned back in his chair and sighed, before asking, how long ago did this happen? The shinobi straightened and asked. About two to three months ago, Kaori and her team had acquired a group and were on their way back to the village before they were intercepted by a team from Konoha. A man sitting next to the rakage looked visibly disturbed when he heard the news and could not help but ask, she was a capable shinobi, so it doesn't make any sense why she did not make any attempt to reach the village or any of our bases in Shimagakure. The shinobi replied, the Kanoha group that was pursuing her and her team was led by Uchiha Fugaku. Immediately the name was uttered, the whole atmosphere of the room changed with everyone's faces darkening. A majority of them even felt a shiver pass through their spine. This was the effect that Achiha Fugaku had on his enemies. He was barely 20 but was regarded as one of the most fearsome shinobi to go up against. This was more commendable considering the fact that he had yet to participate in any shinobi war. The only major fight he had under his name was when the major shinobi was keeping Konoha busy during the siege of Yuzushiogakure. But why would Hiruzen send him on such a mission? Someone asked. No one answered him, either because they did not know or because they were still processing the loss of Kaori and her team. I knew that their plans were not foolproof but since they were desperate, they hoped that Kaori and her squad would succeed. She was a good shinobi, so it was good she died serving the village. I just hope that the other squads we sent to the other villages will succeed, especially the one in Kiri. Otherwise, I will have to figure out how to create another Kekiai Genkai that can be used by normal shinobi in the village. The rakage gestured for the shinobi to leave so that they could resume the meeting. With a swift bow, the shinobi flickered from the room, leaving a deep in thought, that was a show of force, so Hiruzen was sending a message. If the third Hokage was to become aware of this he would be on cloud 9. He did not have to do much, but A already came to a favorable conclusion for him. Back in Kanoha, Renjiro was just beginning his day. Ah. He yawned. Good things today I don't have a shift at the prisons, so after training I can go to Kushina. I need to ask her for pointers for the last barrier. With a plan already in mind, Renjiro proceeded to his squad's training and immediately flickered to Kushina's place. Have you already mastered the barrier ninjutsu that I suggested? She asked the minute Renjiro's visage was revealed. Yes, I did, except the final one, Renjiro replied. That was already fast. It would have been surprising if you mastered it in under two weeks. I don't know why I'm always shocked by his fast comprehension. She thought before asking, first, show me the other five techniques before we start working on the final one. With that, Kushina guided Renjiro to the center of the training area, where a designated spot had been marked out. Renjiro promptly did as asked as he demonstrated the required barriers. Kushina was nodding at his progress and she even gave guidance on ways that Renjiro could improve that subset of ninjutsu. So what exactly is the issue? Kushina asked. I have been working on it for the last week or so, but I have only been able to flawlessly erect the barrier thrice or twice. What was the distance you had been practicing on? 
Around 160 meters, Renjiro answered. Were you using any shadow clones? Kushina asked. Renjiro's brows creased while he answered, yes, I have. That might be the issue, she stated. Why? Don't they hasten the process of training? They normally do so, but this ninjutsu requires more concentration, which using shadow clones chip away because you create versions of yourself that can think independently hence straining your mental strength. The barrier needs concentration as much as it needs chakra to run, she began, but that doesn't mean that you can't use it. Just try with three for a start. When you begin performing it regularly and feel comfortable, you can increase the number of clones used to hasten the process. I thought using the shadow clones was a cheat code in learning jutsus. I guess there were special cases. Renjiro thought. He took his position at the center seal and performed the required hand signs. Yet the chakra failed to connect to the other four seals as he intended. This went on for some attempts before frustration nod at Renjiro's resolve. Focus your chakra, Renjiro. Don't worry about the four seals, just focus on the central one, Kushina recommended. That really isn't helping, but oh well. Renjiro thought as he closed his eyes, taking a deep breath to center himself. He began the hand signs once more, channeling his chakra with unwavering focus. At first, the results were no different than before, the barrier failing to materialize despite his efforts. But after repeated efforts, he showed progress. So that's what she meant? Rinjiro thought as he saw his progress. I know that these four seals are a system, but I thought breaking it down and taking the other four seals as components would work. Maybe I was wrong. Rinjiro began channeling his chakra solely to the center seal before it filled up and transmitted to the other seals. In a magnificent display, a bluish barrier was erected around Renjiro. Its boundary was outlined by the position of the four seals, separating him and Kushina. You see? You just needed to focus, Kushina said. Renjiro just marveled at the sight. It is a bit see-through than I thought it would be. I wonder if it is strong? If it is, then I can consider using it while fighting. After the first successful try, Renjiro continued to work on it for the better part of the day until he mastered it. Since he had already performed it, things became progressively easier and Renjiro mastered it at the end of the day. As he prepared to take his leave, Renjiro was interrupted by Kushina's words, now that it looks like you have mastered it, let's see how long it can last. Wait, what? What do you want to do? Renjiro asked with a confused look on his face. Didn't I say it already? I want to test the integrity of your barrier, Kushina repeated. Why? Renjiro, if you are ever in a position where you have to use such a barrier, then that means you need to protect something from someone. The barrier needs to be strong enough for you to meet your goals. Okay, Renjiro relented, then how are you going to test it? By attacking it of course, how else would I test its integrity? No, Renjiro shook his head. There is no way that I am going to let her attack it. It won't even be a fair fight. She has more chakra and more experience in barrier ninjutsu won me. Renjiro thought. Kushina just stood there in silence glaring at the young redhead. What? You have more chakra than me and even more experience in barrier ninjutsu. You might notice some vulnerabilities quicker than I even erect the barrier. Kushina contemplated for a minute before saying, you make some strong points, so I will limit myself to only three attacks. That still doesn't make any diff dash, Renjiro began before he was interrupted. I will only use my chakra senu, Kushina said as she smirked. She really isn't going to let this go, is she? Fine, Renjiro said as he made new seals and placed them closer to him this time. He accepted the challenge with a pinch of trepidation. Wait, Kushian said before taking what looked like a pill from the pouch on her belt and handing it to Renjiro. Are you really giving me a soldier pill? He asked as he studied the dark round pill. Yes, I know the normal one doesn't really do much for you but this one is different. I don't want you to start using the fact that you have been using your chakra reserves to master the barrier as an excuse. Is she kidding me? Renjiro's eyes twitched at the plain taunt but nevertheless, he took the pill. Seconds after, he was assaulted by its revitalizing effects. True to Kushina's words, the pill enabled Renjiro to replenish most of his chakra. He then focused his chakra and bent to touch the central seal and after a hand sign, the bluish barrier materialized all around him. Are you ready? Kushina inquired. 
Renjiro was in no mood to talk and just gave her a nod. Prepare for the worst Renjiro. Renjiro thought as he decided to use more than half his reserves to fortify the barrier. As a result, the already fade blue barrier got a new sheen as it gradually got darker. He knew Kushina was going to win, but he wouldn't let her have an easier time. After receiving the nod from Renjiro, Kushian took a deep breath before five adamantin chains manifested around her. Contrary to his expectation, the chains did not immediately attack Renjiro's barrier but just swirled around Kushina. What is she planning? Renjiro thought. The fact that Kushina did not attack immediately nerved him. All of a sudden, Kushina's chains lashed out at Renjiro with lightning speed, their razor-sharp edges slicing through the air with deadly precision. Shit dash, boom. The first chain struck the barrier with a resounding impact, sending ripples cascading across its surface. I knew the chains were this strong, but even using the word strong was an understatement. Renjiro thought as some cracks in the barrier caught his attention. It was clear they were a result of the collision. He channeled more chakra into the barrier, returning it to its previous condition. Ho, ho. It looks like you have really mastered this barrier ninjutsu. I now have two more tries, Kushina said as the chains retracted to a couple of meters above her head. As Kushina finished her statement, the chain congregated in one place before. What the hell? Rinjiro could not help but blurt out loud. The chains above Kushina's head were spinning at a rapid speed. They were even affecting the air around them and creating a vortex. With their crimson sheen, it looked more like a red vortex was forming above Kushina. Without any signal, the chains lashed at Renjiro for the second time. But this time, Renjiro was prepared. Using his Sharingan, he realized the trajectory of the spinning chains and used more of his already dwindling chakra to reinforce the point where the chains would meet the barrier. Things would be perfect, right? Unfortunately for Renjiro, the chains separate at the last minute, hitting the barrier at five different points. Shatter! The barrier shattered like glass and fell down to the ground. The only piece of the barrier that was left standing was the around right in front of the bending Chunin. Renjiro was standing there clenching his teeth. Did she know that I knew what her plan was? That was good Renjiro, Kushina began as she clapped her hands, you already got the point without even me having to teach you a lesson. Huh? Renjiro was confused. Sustaining barriers is one of the easiest things to do, Kushina stated. Renjiro was still not getting her point. Noticing the look on his face, Kushina added, what you did before the second attack is the best way to sustain a barrier. You only need to give it enough chakra for it to run then focus on reinforcing the points where the attacks would land, hence minimizing the amount of chakra you need when defending. The realization hit Renjiro changing his facial expression before he remarked, but in the end, you still saw through that and attacked at separate points. You need to be fast enough to act against that. If you continue working on your reflexes, then this will become second nature to you, Kushina stated. She's right. Being fast enough to do this might give off an impression of near-endless chakra to the enemy. Once they suspect that, or even believe it, then it would make things easier for me. Wait, you just said that I got the point before you had to teach me a lesson. This wasn't a lesson? Renjiro questioned. Anyway speaking of lessons, I think it is safe to say that you have mastered the basics of barrier ninjutsu or you are close to doing so, Kushian quickly changed the subject. Renjiro just glared at her with annoyance. So we can now begin with Yin and Yang release, Kushina said before turning to Renjiro and asking, how much do you know about Yin and Yang release? Renjiro shook his head and said, not enough to speak on it. What? Renjiro asked since Kushina was giving him a weird questioning look. Didn't I tell you to look it up more than a week ago? She questioned. I was busy, Renjiro stated. Kushina kept giving him the same questioning look that prompted him to answer. It was as if she was asking what he meant when he said he was busy. Between my shift at the prisons, training with the squad and learning barrier ninjutsu, I didn't get time for it. Accepting the reply, Kushina asked. Do you want me to explain the whole concept, or should I just show? This question was music to Renjiro's ears. He grinned before answering. Of course, I want you to show me, Renjiro replied. All right then, show me one of your simplest ninjutsu, Kushina said as she stepped away, giving Renjiro room to showcase his ninjutsu. 
Rinjiro nodded and took a deep breath before releasing the great fireball jutsu. Flames erupted from his mouth in a blaze of intensity, casting a warm glow across the training area as he unleashed the ball of fiery torrent with practice precision. Kushina observed his technique with keen interest and nodded approvingly, that is impressive Renjiro, but watch this and tell me the difference. With a series of fluid hand signs, Kushina channeled her chakra with effortless grace. Renjiro, who had activated his Sharingan, watched in awe as Kushina unleashed her version of the great fireball jutsu, her flames burning brighter and hotter than his own. Damn. This power is outrageous. It is almost as powerful as other A or B rank fire style jutsu. The air crackled with energy as the colossal fireball hurtled towards its target, dwarfing Renjiro's modest effort in both size and intensity. She isn't using more chakra, that I can tell, but why is her fireball more potent? Renjiro questioned. He could vaguely see the chakra Kushina used, which wasn't a lot, so he was very confused on how she was able to pull that off. I'm guessing this is thanks to the Yin and Yang release you were talking about? Renjiro surmised. Yes, Kushina began, chakra is made up of these two components. Yin is mental and spiritual energy, while Yang is the life energy of our biological forms. A ninja supplies both in some ratio, mixing or molding them together to form chakra. To make it simpler, Yin release deals with techniques that are fueled purely by spiritual energy. Using the Yin component of chakra, someone can bring form to something that is purely from their own imagination. Jinjutsu, typically, is Yin release. So is the Nara clan's family techniques among other ninjutsu, Yang, however, deals with physical energy and vitality, and the manipulation or creation of life within a form. Like the Akimichi clan's multi-size techniques are Yang, and most medical ninjutsu are probably heavily Yang-based, as you encourage the body to heal by supplying it with your life energy. Kushina finished. So every jutsu we use, be it jinjutsu, ninjutsu or even taijutsu, is a combination of both components since they require chakra? Renjiro asked out of curiosity. Yes, you are spot on, Kushina agreed. But this still doesn't explain your earlier demonstration. Renjiro countered. When I told you to read about yin and yang release, I wanted you to know the balance and figure out a way to use it to your own favor. The ninjutsu you did, the great fireball jutsu, is mostly yang release. The only problem is that you also mixed in your yin release there, hence dampening its true potential. But doesn't the balance exist for a reason? Renjiro asked. There is no harm in channeling full-on yin and yang chakra in different scenarios. This is another aspect of chakra control because the balance is only there since that is the default composition of our own beings. You channeling more yang release to elemental jutsus is like you using weights to improve your core muscles, there's nothing wrong with that. So does this mean that when I am using jinjutsu I should only use the yin part of chakra to improve its potency? That would probably work from Kushina's explanation. Wait, is this how Fugaku improved his jinjutsu prowess? I won't lie, but I expected more from this when she mentioned it which was stupid now that I think about it since proper mastery of Yin Yang release is limited only to Rinnegan users. Still, this is a good technique to have even if mastered to the rudimentary level. However, the chakra control required to use it needs to be precise. From the way Kushina is talking, it seems like forcing your body to grow a new pair of arms since you are basically splitting your chakra into two. So how do I learn this? Renjiro asked with an expecting look. Mastering Yin and Yang release requires a deep understanding of the balance between opposing forces, Kushina began, to achieve this balance, we must learn to split our chakra into its constituent parts, Yin, representing the spiritual aspect, and Yang, representing the physical aspect. Renjiro nodded as Kushina went on, get into the normal meditation position. Close your eyes and focus on your chakra, Kushina instructed, Feel the flow of energy within you, pulsing and swirling with untapped potential. Now, imagine that energy dividing into two distinct streams, one bright and vibrant, representing yang, and the other serene and ethereal, representing yin. Visualization? That's what we are going with? Renjiro thought. Renjiro followed her guidance, delving deep into his chakra with unwavering focus. Contrary to what he normally did when meditating, which was cycling around his chakra to all parts of his body, this time, 
he didn't move his chakra and just focused on willing it to split into two. Now, visualize channeling each aspect of your chakra separately, Kushina continued her voice now a soothing presence. Focus on Yang, with its strength and vitality. Then, shift your focus to Yin, allowing its spiritual essence to infuse you with subtlety and finesse. Crack. Renjiro was not sure if he was mistaken, but he was sure he heard that sound. Or rather he felt it would be more precise. His chakra, which he visualized as a tapestry now had a slit to it. The slit was not as straight as he might have wished because it happened nearer to the side of the tapestry, like a piece of cloth tearing apart. When Renjiro focused more on that part of the tapestry, it only tore away quickly. If Renjiro had to give a color to chakra it would be blue, because that is what his Sharingan always showed him. But now, the piece of cloth was magenta with shades of blue at the end. Renjiro could not touch it, but he could feel it. It was an incomprehensible feeling. Kushina, who was closely monitoring Renjiro, almost choked in surprise. I knew that from his ancestry, with Uchiha having one of the most potent in chakra in the village and the Uzumakis having the same for Yang chakra, it would be fairly easier for him to achieve this. But I did not expect him to do it this quick. I only did so after weeks, and that was when I was using Nine Tails chakra to haste the process. That's good, Renjiro now tried to absorb it, Kushina instructed. Renjiro tried to absorb the piece of cloth and it seeped into his skin the moment he touched it. Next, he felt a surge of power coursing through him. This wasn't the usual chakra, it was the same as when he used chakra to amplify his physical attributes only more potent. This must be Yang chakra because I feel like my body has more power than when I use normal chakra to fortify it. How do you feel? Kushina asked Renjiro the moment he saw him opening his eyes. I feel stronger when I use Yang chakra to fortify my body. It is way stronger than before, but ends more quickly. That's because you only used a smaller quantity of Yang Chakra. Once you get used to it, then you'll quickly see the vast difference. Renjiro nodded as Kushina continued, you need to retrain all your Jutsus to use its required Chakra component. Not only will this boost your capabilities, but it will also increase your Chakra control. At least now I have some leeway in creating my own Jutsu. Renjiro thought. As the sun dipped below the horizon, casting a warm glow across the village streets as a shinobi stood before a modest wooden door and knocked. Knock. 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 The shinobi was Tachibana, a genin with a stoic demeanor and a determined gaze. He wore the standard attire of a shinobi with his forehead protector gleaming faintly. He was an aide to one of the village elders, a well-paying administrative job. It was less dangerous work than the on-field shinobi one where he almost lost one of his limbs. Seconds passed, yet, there was no response from within. Undeterred, Tachibana knocked once more, this time with a touch more urgency. Knock. 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 As Tachibana's knuckles met the door for the second time, the fading light of dusk seemed to hold its breath, waiting in anticipation. But this time, before the echoes of his rap could fully dissipate into the evening air, a gruff voice sounded from within, cutting through the silence like a blade. Come in. A command was heard from the room. With a steady hand, he reached for the doorknob, and turned it slowly, pushing the door open with a soft creak. As the door swung inward, it revealed a dimly lit interior. The room beyond was simple yet welcoming, with wooden furnishings and chairs arranged in a cozy arrangement. In the center of the room sat a figure carrying an air of authority. Close the door behind you, the voice commanded again, its tone gruff yet not unkind. With a nod, Tachibana complied, pulling the door shut behind him. What is it? The figure asked with his gaze fixed on Tachibana. It's the Kanoha Shinobi, they have arrived, Tachibana said with a bow. Already? It's good they did because I am sure we will need their help sooner than we expect. Kano Tetsuo thought. He was the village chief of Ishigekure, the village hidden in stone. While he was not yet strong enough to refer to himself as a Kage, he was still a village leader. With a brisk nod, Tachibana turned on his heel, his footsteps echoing softly on the wooden floorboards as he made his way back to the door. Pulling it open with a practiced hand, he gestured for the waiting shinobi to enter. Please come in, he said, the village chief is ready to see you now. As the four Kanoha shinobi entered the room, Kano Tetsuo regarded them with a measured gaze and spoke with a neutral tone, 
Thank you for coming, we heard what was happening, so we came as quick as we could, Fujioka stated. Rinjiro meanwhile, was studying the man who had just welcomed him, it is surprising that Konoha managed to get a glorified outpost recognized as the land of stones by the other shinobi villages. It was thoughts like things that reminded Renjiro of how he got to Ishigekure. His day started normally as he was still relearning all his ninjutsu. He was not done with using Yang Chakra to increase their strength but he was close to. The only good thing is that since he knew a handful of Jinjutsu techniques, he was done mastering them with In Chakra release. If I were to compare myself to when I was still a genin, I think I've grown stronger. Not where I want to be, but I am in the right direction. I have already learnt more ninjutsu and even those are more powerful than they were before. Rinjiro's thought echoed. Anyway, there's no time to daydream. I still have a lot of things to do and learn. I also have my shift later in the day. Rinjiro got up and headed to the police base for his usual daily squad training. After that, he planned on making some seals during his time manning the prisons. Upon reaching the base, Rinjiro was shocked, only Toto was there. Tobe was always punctual, so him not being present was not to be taken lightly. He is now basically the deputy squad leader since he was promoted to the first rank, so something must be happening. Wait, what date is it today? I should have remembered. Fujioka already planned to have us take a mission. With the recent changes in their squad, Fujioka needed an assistant and Tobe was the best option among the three second rankers in the squad. Renjiro had not even spent half a year in the force and Toda, well, let's just leave it at Tobe being the better option. How are you, Toda? Is Tobe coming with Fujioka-sama? Yes, they have gone to pick the mission we will be taking, so they will be here in a few minutes, Toda nodded. Fortunately for Renjiro, he did not have to wait for long before Fujioka appeared with Tobe in tow. They did not have to get their missions from the mission center as Renjiro did in his genin days since the police force had a similar department under them. It made things like administrative duties run smoothly. It's good that everyone is here, Fujioka began as his gaze shifted from person to person in the room, we have been tasked with an A-rank mission that in helping Shinobi in Ishigekure. An A-rank mission? There is a huge difference between B and A rank missions and the latter is solely reserved for Jounin groups and we only have one of them in the squad. Fujioka-sama, is there any reason why you picked an A rank mission? We are two men down, so it wouldn't be as easy to complete as before, Renjiro wanted to ask the same question but Toda beat him to the punch. Fujioka turned to Toda and said, it will only be harder but not impossible, besides, you and your brother are close to becoming Jounins, so it will be fine. What's the worst that could happen? There he goes. He just had to raise the flags. Now I am sure something weird will happen during this mission. Renjiro inwardly lamented. We will only help Ishigekure against a force that has been targeting them since they are our allies, Fujioka added. With that, the squad took an hour for final preparations before they left the village. Ishigekure was located between the land of wind and the land of earth, so the distance they had to traverse was large. Author forward slash forward slash, you can google the Naruto land map so that you could see the distance. Along the way, Renjiro pieced the fact that Ishigekure and the whole land of stones was just a glorified outpost for Konoha from the details Tobe gave him. It was a nation founded after the first shinobi war. From the war concessions the fire daimyu received from the daimyus of earth and wind, Hiruzen persuaded him to recognize the people living there as a nation. Hiruzen knew that occupying them would not benefit them and decided to form a nation backed by Konoha from the shadows. Of course, after that, the land of stones and Ishigekure faced a change of leadership as those who favored Konoha rose to power. How that came to be was a story for another day. So, what is the force that has been attacking you guys? Fujioka asked the village chief. Kano Tetsuo took a moment to gather himself before explaining, at first we thought they were just normal bandits but after facing them a few more times they started transforming into monsters. Beasts or monsters? Fujioka inquired with a puzzled look. Yes, monsters. When they transformed they became faster and stronger, Kano added. Monsters? While that may sound weird, Chakra can make anything possible in this world. Is there a clan nearby that focuses on some sort of transformation? Renjiro thought. Do they attack at random times or is there a specific time they attack? 
So far they have been attacking randomly which has put my shinobi on alert for a continuous week. This has in turn lowered their morale. That's why dash knock. 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 This time Tachibana did not even wait for a response before directly entering the office. Tetsuo-sama, I am sorry for barging in but there is an emergency. The aide hurried in saying. What is it? It is Dash, they have started attacking the village, Renjiro said, interrupting Tachibana. As Kano Tetsuo was explaining the situation to Fujioka, Renjiro picked up a disturbance on his chakra field that was active. Hmm. Someone is heading to the village. It must be the shinobi belonging to the village. They must have been called back for the village due to recent attacks. Renjiro's chakra field had seen an explosive growth over the last few years. It had increased from a mere 120 meters to a whole 1.1 kilometers, just a bit over half a mile. While most of it was due to the natural growth his body was experiencing, the Magatama process added a majority of the distance. Renjiro was now a walking radar. The fact that he was in a minor village like Ishigekure, which occupied a lesser area, was just icing on the top. This was because Renjiro could sense the whole village and beyond if he put more effort. As more and more people entered Renjiro's sensing range, the alarm bells in his head rang. This was not because of their number, but because of their chakra signatures. They are definitely stronger than Kanoha Chunins. Some even as strong as the village. These people can't be from the village, they are the attacking force. Right when Renjiro wanted to inform Fujioka and the village chef, his aide Tachibana barged into the room and did so, or at least tried to since Renjiro was the one who technically did so. When the rest registered what Renjiro meant, they did not waste time and immediately got out of Kano's office. When they did so, they were met with a scene of chaos and devastation. Over 50 shinobi moved with ruthless efficiency through the village. They seemed to strike from every direction, launching coordinated attacks on both civilians and shinobi alike. Ishigekure was only a minor village, so they did not have better defensive measures against enemies other than the shinobi present in the village. Even the backing of Kanoha could only get them a few few injutsu barriers. But with the constant attacks from this unknown group, the only thing they could count on was the Kanoha shinobi previously stationed here. Unfortunately, even they needed a break which was why Fujioka's squad was brought over. They had barriers before all these attacks began, but the attackers got through it. They must have a few Injutsu master on their side. If he is really experienced, then this would be a hassle. They have a few Injutsu expert with them, so be careful, Renjiro warned his squad. As he did so, Kano recollected himself and started issuing orders to his shinobi in an attempt to rally them and set up a response against the attackers. Fujioka also did the same and instructed, use maneuver 5. Renjiro, Tobe and Tota quickly understood the plan of action and after a brief exchange of looks and nods, they flickered in different directions leaving Fujioka, Kano and his aide Tachibana. We will try to mitigate the damage and handle the strong ones, Fujioka said before he too flickered in a different direction like his squad members. It's good that they are here. At least now we won't be spread thin. Hopefully, this time we won't lose much. Kano Tetsuo thought as he saw the Kanoha squad leader leave. As Ishigekure's response began, the Kanoha squad was following their leader's directive. The brothers, Tobe and Tota, had flickered to the south while Renjiro and Fujioka went to the north and east respectively. This was the whole concept under Maneuver 5. They had to mitigate the damage and since a majority of Ishigekure shinobi were stationed in the west of the village, they chose other areas that were left unchecked. Hmm, some chunins. 7, ha, huh, just enough. But they are attacking Ishigekure shinobi, so I need to be careful. Drawing 8 kunais, for on both hands, Renjiro threw them at the enemy chunins before following them with wind bullets. The enemy chunins were on high alert and since they were skilled fighters, they either dodged the incoming projectiles or deflected them using their bladed weapons. But Renjiro's next attack, the wind bullets, gave him enough time to address the Ishigekure shinobis, go. What? Is he planning on taking them on alone? One Ishigekure shinobi wondered. Clang. Metal clashing with metal reverberated. While he was still standing there in his thoughts, something brought him out of his trance. I said go. The shinobi heard Renjiro shouting at him again. What just happened? 
The shinobi thought as he joined his fellow shinobi in leaving. While he had been standing there, one of the enemy chunin had thrown a kunai at him, but Renjiro was quick on his feet and used a kunai of his own to change the projectile's trajectory. As the shinobi left, Renjiro turned his focus on the seven enemy chunin. While still planning his next move, one of them lunged forward at him. Renjiro reacted instinctively as he leaned to the side to dodge and launched a kick at the guy. The attack connected, and the guy was thrown a couple of meters, but the enemy chunin landed on his feet. Unfortunately for Renjiro, he did not get much time to breathe as three more chunin came at him and launched their moves. Good thing his fast reflexes helped him see through their attacks, and Renjiro even launched a few jabs at them. In the corner of his eyes, Renjiro saw three out of the seven chunins heading somewhere else. He had to keep them occupied, so Renjiro got his own version of explosive tags and used kunais to throw them right in front of the three. Boom! The tags were activated as the blast of the explosion threw the three chunin back. Where are you going? Aren't we having fun? Renjiro taunted as he stabbed the throat of one of the four remaining chunins who were engaging him in close combat with a kunai. They were also surprised by the explosion tags going off. Seeing their comrade die, the three enemy chunins were angered and after exchanging a few glances, they jumped a couple of meters behind and quickly made some hand signs. After they did so, they took a deep breath and exhaled elemental attacks towards Renjiro. They all exhaled water, fire and wind separately towards Renjiro whom they had surrounded. Renjiro saw the attacks coming, but instead of flickering away since there was no way he could dodge them, he jumped up trying to do a backflip and used the Jutsu fire style, dragons breathe at the chunins below him. Boom! The Jutsu hit the three chunins at point-blank range. With the force generated and the high temperatures, Renjiro knew that it would be hard, even for him, to escape that attack. The Jutsu Renjiro had just used also provided enough force for Renjiro to correct his posture and land gracefully on the ground. At least that did some damage. Renjiro thought as he witnessed the aftermath of the Jutsu. I was waiting for the Ishige Kyur Shinobi to get out of range before using any destructive Jutsus. How many survived? Only two were caught up in the blast? They are more durable than I thought. Seeing four Chunins coming out of the ground, where they entered to protect themselves from the fire jutsu, Renjiro decided to end this thing once and for all as he activated his Sharingan. Since they were already worn out and laden with injuries, the four Chunins did not resist and were immediately caught in Renjiro's Jinjutsu. What should I make them do? Renjiro wondered before mentally willing a command at them. The four Chunins each drew a kunai at both of their hands before attempting to strike their necks with them. Renjiro wanted them to kill themselves. However, this was not to come to fruition as just as the kunai were inches from their necks, a figure appeared and knocked the four Chunin out. From his dressing, which was similar to the enemy Chunins, Renjiro already concluded that the new arrival was their superior. The figure then turned to Renjiro and scoffed, neat trick, Uchiha. And that concludes this episode. If you enjoyed it, I'd seriously love it if you guys could leave a like on the video as it genuinely helps out so much, and it keeps me going, plus it takes only one second. That said, have a wonderful day. See you in the next one.